And welcome everybody live to the Jim Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. I'm your host, Jim Masters. Thanks so much for stopping by. JMS, it's so good to see everybody here from all around the world. We welcome all of our viewers who watch all across the United States and Canada throughout North America. All of our faithful, lovely viewers who watch in South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, New Zealand. It's so nice to have you here. We realize when we do these shows that since we have an international audience, uh, viewers watch from all different parts of the globe, all different time zones. So we say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We are coming off the heels of our fantastic three-year anniversary epic celebration uh, this past weekend uh, as we approach almost a thousand episodes in just three years of our Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show series. It's been absolutely amazing. And I'm still glowing from all of those celebrity friends who stopped by, all the viewers who were with us. If you missed that episode, you can see it archived right here on the YouTube channel. And that is where we house and archive all of the episodes, every episode with all the fabulous celebrity friends and guests from Broadway and Hollywood, television, film, music, stage, culinary arts, sports, comedy, inspiration, health and wellness, and so much more authors and, and you name it, who stop by and grace us with their presence and their wit and wisdom. And uh, you can see all the episodes archived on our YouTube channel, which is Jim Masters TV. As a matter of fact, if you would like to comment during our show and interact with us, I'm a very interactive host, uh, feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel, which is the channel you're watching right now. And when you subscribe to the YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV, which costs nothing, you can actually comment right now in what we call the JMS Lovety Hall chat room. On the YouTube channel to the side of the screen, there is a uh, chat hall opportunity, a little chat room there. We call it the JMS Lovety Hall chat room. And a lot of folks, our viewers, they uh, say hello to one another. They've become friends. They uh catch up with everybody. They say hello to us. Sometimes you might even sprinkle a comment or two on the screen as well. So if you want to participate and interact with us while the show is on, we always give you that opportunity live in our JMS Lovety Hall chat room when you subscribe to the YouTube channel. And of course, you can also comment on our YouTube channel underneath the episode as well. If you don't get a chance to chat when the show is on live, we again love those comments. Definitely drop a comment on the YouTube channel under the episode. Let us know what you enjoy. Now, we're going to talk food, and we're going to talk food with a dear friend and a real expert who loves food and is somebody who uh, has been immersed in the culinary arts for a long time. She's dedicated her life to it. We're talking about Priscilla Martell. She is uh, in Connecticut, right, in southern New England, not far from you know, the beautiful uh, shoreline and the Iverton Playhouse, sort of in the central southern part, you know, Goodspeed Opera House, not far. It's a very picturesque area of uh, Connecticut. I don't know if you've ever been, but I would recommend uh, taking a uh, tour through the area. A lot of poets, a lot of artists in the area. And it's just a beautiful spot where she is. She's a uh, renowned and celebrated chef, as well as a food consultant, recipe developer, food writer extraordinaire, cookbook author. She's even done work with Martha Stewart, was on Martha Bakes season 11, and so much more. And uh, she and I have actually known each other for a long time because we've been very supportive of something that if you guys follow me on social media, Jim Masters TV on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you know, for many years, over 10 plus years, I've uh, been master of ceremonies for a very, very important organization called Columbus House. And they have their annual chocolate to the rescue, which again is a, a fundraiser to help uh, raise funds to find housing for the homeless and shelter as well. And, and Priscilla has participated in that a uh, long time as well as one of the master judges. She gets to try all the different chocolates and then take notes and there's prizes and all kinds of stuff. So uh, through that is where we initially met, actually. And there's a fantastic shot of us, actually, with some of the other uh, fabulous judges, Chris Pasperi there, and of course, Lee White, who was another fabulous food critic and more. 
Uh, we just lost her actually last September. She's on the right there, the far right with the, uh, the glasses and the black outfit with the stripes. And Priscilla and I are there on the left. And uh, we just all get together and we love this event. This was actually the very recent. This was in March at the Chocolate to the Rescue event. Uh, which is in Connecticut to, again, raise funds for the support of Columbus House and their beautiful work. And Priscilla was there as uh, one of the incredible judges. And uh, we're going to talk about, we always have a wonderful time when we're all together. It's such a beautiful, beautiful event. Priscilla, again, as I mentioned, is uh, somebody who really, really loves what she does. She's passionate about it and she's touched so many lives. She teaches as well. She's an instructor which I think is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so she pays it forward, which is something I think is very, very special. We're going to talk about all of it. We're really going to touch upon so many cool things. Now, if you have questions about food, about preparation, about recipes, about technique, perhaps maybe about you know what to do with the spatula that's sitting there in the kitchen or anything, feel free to comment in the Jameis Lovety Hole chat room. We know we have a foodie audience. I, I did a whole two-hour show, two-and-a-half-hour show once where I cooked a meal and we just chat and you, you guys sent in recipes and we did a whole uh, live foodie show uh, not that long ago, which was really, really fun. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about our very special guest. And again, I see a lot of comments coming in. So good to see everybody. If this is your first time watching the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series, we welcome you and we hope you'll continue to join us and spread the word about our series. We're here in the New York area as well between New York and Boston along the Southern New England coast. That's where this show originates from. Now, Priscilla is an American chef and food consultant. As I mentioned, living in Connecticut, she works the savory side as a cookbook author, recipe developer. And she's known for her expertise in bread baking and desserts. As a food writer, she's traveled the world visiting almond growers, bakers, flavor scientists, pastry chefs, and a really a fabulous manner of farm and fishery. Her aim is to show some of her work in the hopes of inspiring others to be bold and curious in their food discoveries. And when Charlie went over and she opened up Restaurant de Village in Chester, Connecticut, back in 1979, they were pursuing their dream of capturing the spirit of France in a country restaurant. And for 11 wild and delicious years together, they lived the dream. That experience launched her career and gave them a delightful place to call home. She says she's been very fortunate from her start in the restaurant business to becoming a baker, cookbook author, food consultant, and exciting food experiences that she has an opportunity to be front and center for for much of her life in Chester, Connecticut, a magical place in the banks of the Connecticut River, about two hours from Boston, two hours from New York City. She keeps a small garden and shop at the farmer's market in season. She loves to do that. Only a few minutes from the Long Island Sound as well. And uh, she absolutely loves what she does. She's got a wonderful website. She also has a newsletter. We're going to talk about that. In the kitchen, you'll find recipes on tips and ingredients, equipment, cooking techniques, and all of it. She shares her tasting notes from learning about olives and all kinds of incredible things. And as I mentioned, her love of almonds and lots of breads. It's just, we're going to make you hungry with this particular episode, folks. Truly, um, she is a master at what she does. As I've mentioned as well, the cookbooks. We're going to talk about that. She was also, again, with Martha Stewart on season 11. Uh, there was an episode of season 11 of Martha Bakes. You may recall seeing that. That was a great series as well. And uh, again, she just loves what she does. And we're so excited that uh, she's actually taking a moment or two to stop by. And look at this. This is going to really tickle your fancy. This is a heart baguette. We're not going to just show it to you. We're going to talk about that and lots more as we uh, welcome our friend to the show for the very first time. And I know it won't be the last time. I see, again, a lot of wonderful comments coming in here, everybody. Thanks so much for making us a part of your day. Spread the word about our show. And without further ado, let's welcome from her beautiful home 
in Connecticut, Priscilla Martell. Priscilla, welcome to the show, my friend. It's so great to have you here. God, so much fun to be with you, Jim. Thank you for that. <laughs> unbelievable introduction. I don't think I know that person. <laughs> this is super. I'm really, really happy to be uh, get, getting to spend the evening with you in my in my office library where I occasionally spend a few hours. <laughs> That's a beautiful, cozy spot. And as you and I were talking about beforehand, you know, a lot of times during uh, the last couple of years where people have been doing a lot of online stuff, they'll have a shelf like what you have behind you with all those books, but it'll be a, a green screen. A, <laughs> it's not real, but that's a real shelf with real it books is. behind you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I know all the books. I know what's where I, where I need to go to get this or that thing. Um, yeah. I feel very attached to those physical objects as yes. repositories of information. They make me feel secure and I have Absolutely. a lot of faith in the printed, the printed word. Absolutely. As you are so secure and comfortable uh, in the kitchen as well. And I was mentioning that you and I have had this really uh, blessed opportunity to uh, lend our support for Chocolate to the Rescue and the folks at yes. Columbus House, which do such great work. And it was just recently when we were together in March, when I had mentioned, we just had another mutual friend, Chef Jacques Pepin was just with us. And I said, Priscilla, I'd love to have you pop on and talk about all the wonderful things that you're up to. And you said, Jim, just tell me when and where and I'll be there. And I really appreciate that, Priscilla. Uh -huh. My pleasure. Really happy to be here. That that Chocolate to the Rescue event, besides being so tasty for the visitors, I mean, we really have to praise all the vendors that donate their wonderful talent and products to support the important, uh, really, a, it's a women's shelter for abused people. And uh, it's a very, very important cause. So I was so happy that it got to happen again because we had a two year suspension, I think, during COVID. There was, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, what is it like tasting all those goodies? Because you guys, you know, as the experts, you have a certain window and they're just bringing you chocolate creation after chocolate creation. Are you floating on a chocolate well, high when you leave? Listen, when you start <laughs> doing any kind of tasting as a food person, when you start, you have eyes that are so large and you eat everything and you really regret it. So <laughs> now, after having done this for many, many years in many different ways, you learn to take that little tiny bite and experience the whole thing. Otherwise, I just couldn't make it through. I think we've had 13 things to try. <laughs> and then they bring us extra because we're the judges. Yes. Yeah, it was crazy. There was a delicious um, babka, chocolate swirled babka which was great, but bread is a little, you know, heavier and bulkier. I wanted to eat the whole slice, but I, I, I paced myself. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, I did. I mean, I made it to the end. The last dessert was especially good too. It was a, a local uh, fellow who's um, got a, you know, small business in Middletown. It was some kind of a little chocolate cookie mousse thing. Yeah, that's right. I remember that. <laughs> yes, in, in between my and what I've eaten. <laughs> I was gonna say, in between my emceeing the event, I I try to sneak in some samples as I'm floating from place to place with everybody. I, I know in doing my research, you do have a uh, you do have a thing for babka, don't you? Like chocolate I do. cherry babka. There you go. <laughs> my grandmother was Polish. And I, she, she made wonderful bread, not babka, but then I decided that would be my homage to her, would be wow. to learn to make a babka. So that's a sweet, um, you know, a sweet yeast dough with lots of butter and eggs. Ooh. And you roll it out in a big sheet, like a, yeah. like a rectangular pie crust, and then smear it with a chocolate filling and dried cherries. Roll wow. it up in a log and make it into a wreath, and then um, twist it so it gets those uh, like layers. And then yes. I stored it and the and the filling kind of bursts out. Oh, wow. That that, that <laughs> really does sound delicious. And Thanks. when you said the babka, that was such a perfect uh, segue. For you, uh, growing up, did you come from a home where there was always cooking and baking and things happening? What first inspired you, Priscilla, to have this keen interest in food and the culinary arts? Sure. I always tell people um, my mother loved to entertain, but she did not like to cook. 
but my both of my grandmothers were superb cooks. My Polish grandmother actually ran away from home. Maybe she was 16 years old and went to work in a hotel. And then later, when my mother was growing up, she was the cook for a, a wealthy family. So she knew how to produce lots of tasty, delicious food and was well known in her neighborhood. Mary, her name was Mary, uh, made the pies and during the Second World War, I have her ration card. So I know that she was able to take a certain amount of ingredients and you know, make pies and cakes and breads for her husband and his co-workers at the factory. And then my, my other grandmother, Grammaire, was a wonderful cook, made you know meringues and French Canadian meat pies and the roast turkey that had the meat stuffing that I can still smell to this day. But I was one of those curious kids and um, I, there, everything went in my mouth. I remember eating a, a house plant. It was a big, big leafy house plant with a juicy stem. I gave it a big chomp. I thought, oh, it looks like celery. Well, that was not celery. I never told my mother um, that was a risky thing. But I was always <laughs> curious about tasting and, and nibbling and helping the lady that came when my mother had dinner parties. Wow, that's fantastic. So what were some of the um, the areas, categories of foods that early on sort of spoke to you? Did you have, did you develop a certain palate for certain kinds of cooking and, and preparation I, and cuisines? I think so. I think so. So you know, Julia Child was a big influence in the 60s when I was growing up. She was on PBS. We lived in Massachusetts. My mother went to the Concord kitchenware store and bought little things. And I remember uh, watching the show with my dad and he started to scream ratatouille, ratatouille. And boy, oh boy, we whipped up ratatouille you know, within the next few days. And I made salad niçoise for my girlfriends for my 14th birthday. Ooh. So I had a I had an inclination in that direction, which would be Frenchy food. I was speaking French, you know, in school and learning and that sort of thing. Oh, look, people saying hello. That's so cool. They're all saying <laughs> hello. Yes. <laughs> All over the country, all over the oh, world. So Hi, guys. <laughs> yes. And, um, yeah. Then I, I, uh, when I went to college, I studied American history and you know more traditional subjects, as well as Romance languages. And I got to live in a French language dormitory, Ooh. and we cooked dinner. Teams of two of us cooked dinner for fifty people every night. So that was birth by fire, and. Yeah. Uh, funny way to get started, but I did. So what, what would you consider, would you consider that one of the big opportunities for you? What was something that really started to uh, accelerate the career and the passion for it? Well, I, I mean, I, I did you know, little bits of cooking as I've described, but I met my husband now, you know, then now husband, then uh, fellow when I was in college and he had a lot of cooking experience and we got to cater in the summers when I was uh, out of school and I did take a job working in a restaurant, which was intimidating, mm. totally intimidating. Yes. But it, it turned around. The, I get there and as a birth by fire kind of thing, little lady, you know how to open clams? Oh yeah, sure. They threw a bushel of clams at me. Now, of course I had never opened 400 clams. <laughs> The need and uh, a, a kindly waiter named Jindy. I've always wanted to find this man to thank him again. Showed me how you hold the hold the clam knife and you, you squeeze down on it and you spin it around. And I, I survived. I endured. Um, and and that's the thing about learning to cook. Like many things, once you master each little piece, pardon me, your confidence just grows and grows. And you, you get a base and you get this security, which relates to all aspects of your life. But um, that's where the spark started to become ignited, as you were saying, Jim, when I got to work in a restaurant and the food, I could make food. I mean, it was ridiculously simple, my first job. One of the things was to make a dessert where you scooped a ball of ice cream and molded it and rolled it in toasted coconut. And then when it was ordered, somebody put it under a broiler and then you threw Kahlua on it. So we're talking simple, simple. Oh, man, that sounds good about now, doesn't it? <laughs> if you think about it. Oh, my God, that was considered cooking. Um, it, it was fun. So so that was the ignition in college um, in those summer jobs and working with Charlie. You mentioned Julia Child. Who are some of the others that uh, inspired you along the way? 
inspired me. Well, that was the young time, young years would be my grandmother's and, and Julia Child being this presence on television. And then later, I mean, you can see I have this Frenchy European kind of interest. So starting to read cookbook authors like uh, Claudia Roden, who represented the Mediterranean cooking, um, not so much Marcella Hazan, but uh, Giuliano Bugiali. That was an Italian chef. He, he died not too long ago, who was right. very popular, popularizing Tuscan food in the early mm. 80s. So those, you know, masters of the cuisines. Um, another one is Elizabeth David, who was a food writer in England, who brought Mediterranean and European cooking to homes in Europe, probably uh, in the late 60s into the 70s. So those were the books that I would look at and, you know, making your own vinaigrette salad dressing. Who knew you could do such a thing when we all grew up with the, the wishbone powder that you put in the jar and you shook up? Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's, how, that's how it got started, little by little. Wow, that's fantastic. And you mentioned, of course, the restaurant in Connecticut. What was that like, having a restaurant and maintaining it? And, you know, when you are, when you own and, and are cooking at a restaurant, you do become a uh, part of the community and, and mm -hmm. beloved and people look for you and want to say hello as much as they enjoy the food. What was that whole experience like for you? I'm, I'm so happy that you presented a restaurant as part of a community because that was our vision. You know, in, in France, we were in a town called Macon. There was this little restaurant. Maybe it was like, you know, the restaurant of Macon. Simple. The wife is there. The husband's there. They're all working, making the food. At lunchtime, you could see local businessmen, women eating. And that's really the spirit that we wanted to bring. Not, not that that doesn't exist. It might be more of a bar and grill even then than is now. So the fact that we were able to be part of our community and that people were there waiting for us and supporting us was really fantastic. And without that, we could never have succeeded. And I will say that, I mean, I, I know people who were there the very first days we were open. I still know them today. So, you know, that's 35, 40 years ago. That's an incredible testament. What was it like opening a restaurant when you've never had one? Oh, that was interesting. We did run a funky little um place called uh, the Flying Scotsman. It was run by a Scottish guy and it was a little tavern and we made the regular menu, which maybe included fish and chips and things like that. I don't recall exactly, but we got to do specials. So we would do, you know, cassoulet one day, or we would do choucroute garni, all these different French dishes. And that was the people that supported us there were those who helped us open the restaurant du village. So there's, again, the connection to community. But I remember at the beginning, you know, how many orders of veal are we going to sell? How much veal do you buy? You know, what do you do? Charlie would go to New York and buy special sausages and bring them back. And then we'd run out because you wouldn't know how many people would order this unusual garlic sausage or you know, whatever. So um, definitely learning by doing and yeah, there it was back in the day. Those I love those geraniums. I want to put them on my porch this year. They're called the, the king of the balcony, le roi du balcon. And we thought that that made the restaurant look very European. Um, How did you find that cute little spot too? Yeah, we were when we were working in the Flying Scotsman, uh, we, we started to look for places. We looked in Stonington. We looked all over. Yeah. And this was called Otto's Restaurant. O -T -T oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Otto's name was Walter because Walter bought it from Otto and Walter was a customer and he came in and said, Hey, you guys, you could buy my restaurant. And that's wow. how it happened. And wow. it, it, the town was, the town was, um, you know, it was, it was a underdog town. Yeah, there we are. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's several lifetimes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, look at that. Oh, boy. <laughs> You've got the same rosy cheeks. What are you talking about? <laughs> I was in, yeah, I never comb my hair right. But anyway, <laughs> would tell me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it was um, it was fun. Um, Quite an experience, right? And and uh, the restaurant revered and, and highly respected and people, you know. Uh, I, I, 
we were sincere about it. We, we, you know, yes. we tried very hard. One other thing that was important was the community of our staff. And we're fortunate that many of those people, or a fair number, not many because it's many years, but a fair number of those people are still uh, friends and in the local areas. So that's, that's a really nice thing. Um, it's important to us. When did you decide, you know, time to, to move on from it, time to do other things? Because uh, that's not always an easy decision as well once you no, develop the following, no, right? The 80s, the 80s in uh, our area and in, in our country it had some challenges toward the end of the 80s. We thought it was a good time to change. We had opportunities to do consulting and product development for manufacturing companies, which was a you know different business opportunity. And Charlie's a little older and that made that made sense to us. And um, as we shifted, he went in one sort of direction, and I went in another, taking our knowledge and expertise. I started. I got interested in Mediterranean desserts. Um, I was interested in healthful food traditions. And in 1991, two, three, the Mediterranean diet was a new concept that was being introduced. And I've already described how that those flavors really appealed to me. And it's very amusing that 1991, 92, that was something new. I went on trips with Old Ways Preservation Trust, which promoted the Mediterranean diet. Well, don't you know, about six weeks ago, I went to a Mediterranean diet conference at Yale. So again, we're, we're re-looking at this lifestyle, this way of eating that's um, heavily involved with plants and uh, seafood and olive oil and rich flavors um, and eating in moderate portions with more of a healthful lifestyle. So it's funny how that we've come full circle that way. But um, that work, that work, you know, led to me working in the almond industry, which was a little mm -hmm. bit of a, a sidestep, but it's totally food related. It's totally food related. And that was around, was that like around 1994 or so? Before I started to consult and then I had the opportunity to run this nut company. American Almond Products, the largest and oldest manufacturer of almond paste and oh, nut butters yeah. for the baking industry. And we had used their products in the restaurant. That's why I knew the brand. So I started doing recipes. And then because of some business changes, private company, and you know, there I was. Um, and that was an amazing opportunity to see the other side of how food is produced. Yes. It was a quality, ma but a manufactured product, you know, but a quality product with real ingredients. You know, it's not a, it wasn't a, uh, I don't know which powdered sauce company we're talking right. about nuts and sugar. Oh, and real. Yeah. Straightforward, but I got but, with commodity buying and understanding. But a a pretty cool thing that triggered this for you is this trip to Morocco, huh? Yeah, I was so lucky. Just, you know, a couple people you knew of my interests and there was a there was a sponsored trip and it was with all these olive oil and nut importers and I got to go and, and that's how I met the uh, person who ran the nut company as well as all sorts of interesting uh, people in that part of the industry. But I got to tour an anchovy packing plant and it's funny, Jim, I, I love anchovies nothing like going off topic for a minute. And then oh, my, yeah. next, my next issue of the newsletter, I'm going to do uh, what I call take five. So a take five on anchovies because there are things to learn about them, which I learned on that trip. So on my a list of things to do is to go back. I think I have some um, actual photos, you know, print photos of the tour of that incredible factory. But yeah, so I, you know, got that and got to see these nuts. Um, and I, I realized seeing nuts from almonds from uh, Morocco, they aren't the same. You no. know, who knew? I thought every, you know, every coffee bean's the same. Yeah. But, you know, many years later, we all have an appreciation for varietals like we do in the varietals in wine that give them their flavor. And we have them in every food group. So. Absolutely right. And you, what I like to, and I encourage folks to go to the website, uh, PriscillaMortel.com, is uh, you have a whole section that's really devoted uh, in the kitchen to, to nuts and things like healthy baking with almonds mm -hmm. specifically, uh, and a lot of things that are tied into this love and appreciation for for almonds, yes. I think that's- Thank you for taking the time to look at all that. I, I truly appreciate it. Oh, um, yeah. I could write many books about almonds. I just never got around to it. Uh, it's such a, yeah, there's there's a whole 
half of the shelf there that where my hand is. Yes. That's where in the almond department right over there. <laughs> and then the, the French dictionary food dictionaries are there. <laughs> Everything has its own little place. And in the refrigerator is almond milk, right? You got, well, I make it to, no, I make it from scratch. So there's never, unless I'm just made it, I only make it when I need it. What's that process like? Now that's fascinating for folks and, and gang. If you want to ask any questions about yeah. food preparation, uh, Priscilla is very uh, open and willing. She even suggested, you know, if viewers have any questions, whether you're fans of the Gym Masters show live or you know Priscilla and her work and her books and all, feel free to post something and we'll, you can ask the expert right here, any questions about anything um, and she'll do her best to answer. Um, but yeah, it's anything, Jim, you're going a little far there. Not yeah. Within the culinary <laughs> arts food realm, <laughs> winning lottery numbers that she might not know. <laughs> exactly. <That's right. laughs> Where the gold is buried. I don't know. Um, yeah. So making almond milk is super simple. It does require some kind of a machine like a blender and you, you can buy almonds where the, the skin has been removed. You can make almond milk with the skin. Of course, yeah. it'll be a little bit brown, but better to soak the almonds in boiling water within about eight to 10 minutes. The little skins pop off. Watch the, the dinner, the news, you know, 15, 20 minutes of the news or beginning of your show. You'll have them all peeled. And then they go into a blender with uh, cold, fresh water. It's usually about a cup of almonds and two cups of water for a nice, rich nut milk. The better your blender, the more high speed it is, the finer you can get your almond milk. So people who are fortunate enough to own something like a Vitamix or a Blendtec blender, those more expensive high speed ones might get something fine enough to drink right out of the machine. Otherwise, you can strain it um, through a sieve and then you have some pulp that's left over that can be added to salad dressing or folded into cookie dough or, or cake batter or something like that. So I make it to order. I, I don't keep it on hand. Um, and I don't drink a lot of milk of any kind, you know, yeah. so I use it when I need it. I mentioned that you really love uh, focusing on the savory side of things as well. Um, tell us about some of the other categories that you really super serve in the culinary arts. I will, but I, I grabbed Ooh, one. Oh, look at that. Look at this. This is stump the, stump the viewer. You mentioned savory. Where does it show up the best? Can you see this? Do you know what it is, Jim? Yes. Tell everybody what we're looking at. Do you know at. what it is? Do you? It is. That is. An asparagus um, peeler. See that? See how it has the little, those are the gripping sections. So a skinny asparagus fits in here and you can peel it or a big fat one would go in there. And why did I mention this? Because here we are, it's the beginning of the asparagus season. I saw um, fresh asparagus up in New Hartford the other day when I was visiting my cousin. Oh, I forgot to stop on my way home, but it is the season. And the reason you that it matters, like who gives a, excuse me, who cares about peeling asparagus? Well, you get to eat more of it. So you don't lose the stuff. If it's really tough at the bottom, you have to cut it or break it off. But if you can peel it, you can eat more of the, the whole stock and it's delicious. So this is one so cool. oddball tool. And I don't, you don't have to have that many, but this one oddball tool does come out at this time of the year. Okay. But you, were so asking, you were asking me about the savory side. Okay. <laughs> I love that. I love the way you work that <laughs> I in. That's I had to do show and tell. I'm, I teach, so you've got to keep everybody. I amused. love it. Um, but the savory side, for more than half of the time we had the restaurant, I did end up as the chef in the kitchen. And it was Charlie. Charlie was the chef and then brought in other people. And then it became obvious um, be, that I wanted control and make sure that the food came out on time. And he had the suave charm and the double breasted blue blazer. And he was a fantastic host and I was okay in the kitchen. I mean, I think I was pretty good, um, but that's what people tell me. So I have the ability to coordinate things and make them taste okay and get them out on time. So that experience really informs me, you know, every day I get up, what are we going to eat? What's it going to be? Um, and it helps me for the work that I do writing these textbooks that are used uh, in culinary schools. 
so I understand the principles that are illustrated and I can develop some of the recipes and that sort of thing. Which I think is fantastic. Toby's watching in California and, and she wants to know why does a banana bread turn green if you try sunflower seeds versus walnuts in it? Interesting. I know that in the case of the walnuts, it's the tannins in the skin that blacken around there. So I'm, I'm gathering, and I don't know specifically the composition of sunflower seeds, but I'm pretty sure it's something in that same category where there are natural acids um, or, or tannins in the seeds that will release and um, color the flower and that moisture. That's a great, that's a great question. That's a good question. Yeah. I you put my seeds on top of the, the muffins and the baked goods, because for me, they retain a little more of the crunch and yeah. then that eye appeal. That's just my personal taste. Oh, absolutely. Um, you had this opportunity to, as we meander through a lot of different things, to uh, have the experience with Martha Stewart, uh, with Martha Bakes season 11. Oh, that and that, that series, what was that like for you? It was super. Well, first I was so honored to be asked and they were incredibly thorough in the uh, planning and then allowed me to bring this enormous assortment of stuff. And we worked really hard to identify and label it. And she happens to really like almonds and, of course, baking, as we know from all of her books. And she was incredibly engaged and interested in all the bits and parts. So that was super. And I brought her the special marzipan um, made by a... a bake shop called Monte, Monte, Monte Leone on Carroll Street in Brooklyn. It's a guy from Naples, Italy, who's come to New York. It's owned the place maybe eight, 10 years. So that was a real coup because she was familiar with them and really liked it. So yeah, I was, I was really impressed. I, she, she's really engaged and um, really takes her, her work seriously and, and brings it. So it was, it was a super experience. And now is it, I, on the cover of Sports Illustrated, huh? <laughs> yes. That's amazing. I won't be going neck and neck with her on that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, when was, 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 were, were, you, were, were you going for October? Or? <laughs> <laughs> that's, my that's right. She's a lovely woman. She is, uh, you know, that's a couple of years ago. She has beautiful skin. So <laughs> as that's displayed it. on the screen, yeah. I say October because it's always a good time to have warm soups and then you get those nice squashes like this chorizo squash soup. I'm a soup person oh, and I love squashes yeah. too. Thank you. Yeah, that's such an easy soup. I, I think that, you know, as home cooks, we need to have these easy things in our repertoire. Yeah. So in that recipe that you've pulled up, and thank you for doing so, I I talk about mirepoix, the, the basic flavoring, and how you can riff on that and make so many different soups. So that's one of them. And then I made that bread um, that you see pictured. But chorizo, mm. I love chorizo. It's oh, got that so do smoky, I. forky taste and yes. yeah, a little bit of spice. And chickpeas are in there too. They're always, um, they always give some body to the soup. Yeah. I love a soup. I love casseroles. I love all of that stews. And, and, you know, some people say they only have soup, uh, you know, in the winter time, you give me soup year round, my father, the same way, even my sister. Yeah. I love soup. So what kind, of, what kind do you like? You like that one, but other types that you like. I like that as well. You know, sometimes it depends on the mood, but, uh, I love a really good thick, split pea soup mm. you know just what the comfort uh yes. a creamy potato um i love butternut squash soup mm. yes things of, you know things that are savory but they, they just yes you know yes. so so when i'm i've been doing a butternut carrot red lentil and ginger soup and i haven't i just do it i haven't codified it into a recipe i don't think i have anyway but it is so marvelous. It almost needs no seasoning at all. And I'm, I'm conscious of how much salt we add to our diet and that sort of thing to the point where some of my friends might be questioning me, but I know that you can uh, control your salt consumption. It's totally voluntary. You, you can bring down your salt taste bud needs by lessening the amount. Anyway, so the, the apples, butternut, 
red lentil and carrot, and then I put it into the uh, blender and it's crispy, excuse me, silky smooth. Oh yeah. That's, you know, one of my favorite things I've, I've often said, I don't know if I ever mentioned this too, but I, I've said it publicly many times. And I think it's probably, probably the Irish part of me on my father's side of the family that if God came down and said, Jim, we're going to put you on an Island for the rest of your life. And there's only going to be one thing that you can have to consume forever. What would it be? What would you pick? What of all the fabulous things you could pick? What would you pick, Jim? Mashed potatoes. Really? Oh, <laughs> I love, terrible. I love, oh love mashed potatoes. I told the oh. nuns in grammar school that I was allergic to potatoes. You oh, you told the Irish nuns? The Catholic <laughs> nuns, they were Irish sister, yeah, Sister Catherine Martin. I told them because I was such a fuss pot, I could smell that water from the steam table. You know that funky water in a steam table at a school? Yes. I like that. Now I love mashed potatoes. I love any kind of potato. That is too funny. Tell us about some of the ways that you wait, uh create. Wait, I things. tell you, my favorite, if I were on a desert island. Yes. Guess what it would be? An mm. egg. Eggs. You know, that egg. makes sense. Yes. So many things you can do with an egg. Yes. Yeah. You no, know, I think that's what Jacques Pepin would probably pick probably. as well, would or be chicken. the egg. Yeah, chicken right? or an egg. Exactly. <laughs> Tell us about that friendship. You went on, you and I were chatting uh at uh, the chocolate to the rescue you were headed for uh you know a afternoon lunch with with chef jacques yeah, um, I, how did that wonderful friendship form yeah charlie met jacques oh my god it's, it's you know 1974 or something and then um jacques and his wife gloria moved to madison uh in late 70s and we met them right then and there and and we became friendly you know from 79 or so being then we opened a restaurant. He had a restaurant with Gloria very briefly. You know, there's always a reciprocity chefs hanging out together and Charlie and Jacques were very, are very close. They went hunting together and skiing and all that. And we were fast friends. We've, we've been friends for years. We miss dear Gloria immensely. Really great lady. Oh, Jacques yeah. and Gloria and Charlie and I went to Portugal together one day. Did one you year. really? We had a great time, you know, driving through the countryside, ending up in the coast, uh, going to this amazing grilled fish restaurant called mm -hmm. Ruina, you know, in the ruins where the fish came up off the coast. And then you just picked out in the, in the iced case what you wanted. It was grilled and served to you. Still talk about it. Um, they adopted a dog that they brought home. You know, that dog was part of the family for all those years. So yeah, and, and Claudine is a friend. She worked for mm -hmm. us at the restaurant. <laughs> That's his is working yeah. with him, right? And then I've I've done some little bit of work with the Jacques Pepin Foundation. I have a video on their video library collection, so um, very happy to support his work. Which you may not know, his foundation provides funding to programs that help those people who have barriers to employment. Yes, you know, they could have come out of prison or yeah. had a difficulty getting a job. And the funding helps these community kitchen programs that are free, free schooling for such people. They're all over the country, you know, and usually in urban areas. And it's, he's been very successful. It's run by his uh, son-in-law, Raleigh Wieson, and, and Claudine, his daughter. Yeah, really. So to see the whole circle, right, from, you know, working with him and he you know, being a working professional and then now in the later years doing different things. Absolutely incredible. Well, you as well. I mean, you've had your hands in so many different things, which is in, which is incredible. You mentioned loving to also teach. Tell us about that. You 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 love doing that and paying yeah. it forward, inspiring others, right? Yeah, I really do. I mean, how did we get to where we are without the the inspiration and guidance of teachers? And we're in a period of of incredible change. I'm I'm sure everybody says that. But, you know, here we are to pass on things. And in culinary, um, there are many more career opportunities than there ever were. You can, of course, be a chef in a restaurant, but you can be in a chef in adult retirement community, in a nursing home, in a public school system. You can work in product development 
um, you know, helping create something that's new and healthy or on the go or for NASA uh, or working with different types of foodstuffs to, to uh, you know, protect food waste. You can be making your own beer. I mean, it, it goes on and on. So uh, I think it's really wonderful to be able to work with people and, and teach the fundamentals. Uh, that's one thing I really enjoy doing. I also enjoy helping people find out ways to communicate by using their food memories. So mm. I've only done that in a school environment where they're already culinary or hospitality students, that they're using this so that they can learn to perhaps write menus or marketing materials. But I think all of us have food memories. They're universal, positive, hopefully, perhaps not so positive, and that that can be fodder to help us um, communicate through the written word. Absolutely so, right. This goes back to... Uh -huh, there I am at BU. So yeah, through Jacques, I, I, Charlie and I were introduced to the culinary program at Boston University. This is a certificate program through the Metropolitan College. They have a baking program, a culinary, they have wine programs. And I am a regular teacher for baking. And there's one of my group of students. You'll see they're different ages, um, men and women, boys and girls, if you want to call it that. And I'm giving them a little uh, entry into my favorite way to make bagels, because for some reason, I'm the bagel queen in our household. And there I am. I taught bagel making. You can see the characters underneath. That's over a piece of paper. That was in Tokyo. I did that um, for about a month. I went. Mm. These are Japanese bagels, right? My, yeah, Japanese bagels made by these little hands. The, wow. the, the students were, who were adults, they were you know, recreational um, students. They were so engaged. It was really, really fun. Uh, that's and, and I just made bagels with my buddies from boarding school who I went to school with, you know, very many years ago. And we all made bagels to have at our little reunion that we had at our house last month. Oh, that's so nice. You went to uh, Shanghai as well? Yeah, yeah. So um, because of the knowledge I've acquired for, you know, a 20 plus, 25 plus year working with almonds and the almond industry, I've done work with the Almond Board of California, and they represent the, you know, several thousand growers in California where 80% of the world's almonds are grown. So they, you know, they sponsor trade show booths and such things. And I, I would go over and I did this right until the pandemic for several years and uh, work with chefs who are in big commercial bakeries, maybe developing snacks for their Starbucks. They have an incredible bakery cafe business in China. You have no idea. So mm -hmm. many different brands, really great coffee and cool pastries. And um, I got to talk to, you know, one-on-one -on -one with chefs, some of whom spoke English, often with translators about the different forms and usage and stuff. Really, really great fun. So those two women um, actually work for the Almond Board in their, in their marketing communications divisions. You know, I want to say something because people, people always talk about almonds and maybe you're going to mention water use. And, and we're all super conscious of this. And almonds can be grown in drought areas. You know, they come from the Mediterranean and they're often accustomed to be grown without so much irrigation. One of the interesting things is all tree nuts require a lot of water because you're keeping the tree alive. A tomato plant only produces for a certain amount of time. You, you, so you have to maintain a tree, whether it's a pecan or a walnut or a pistachio or an almond, you have to maintain it. So that's one of the issues with water use. But some of the interesting research, and I'm not as completely fluent on it yet, is calculating the amount of water used per protein or usable calories that are put forth. So I thought I'd put that out there that when we hear some of these simple reasons just to abandon a food group, um, there's perhaps more behind it. But it's definitely, there's a lot of almonds grown and you know maybe we don't need to grate quite so many, uh, but water is such a big concern. Do you love finding facts like that and digging and researching <laughs> sort of the behind the scenes? Does it show? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I like to figure things out. Don't you like to, you know, I like to understand how things work. Yes. And I, I'm perfectly willing to be told that I'm wrong because, you know, you learn something, you get to this point, and then it's like, oops, I missed another piece that has to be added. And added. Right. I like to understand how things work. It makes, helps me see things. 
you know, in terms of sharing the books too, here's a, here's a great one on cooking that you have penned. Uh, this one is really. I'm all, not all by myself. I have my co-author, Sarah Lebensky. Yes. Skip Haas, very important. This is not a one-man show by any means. Textbook of Culinary Fundamentals and Baking, Textbook of Baking and Pastry Fundamentals. Tell us about that. So uh, I started working with the baking book first. I, I worked um, with Eddie Van Dam, this terrific pastry chef. He's Belgian born and trained and he works in Houston. He's so talented. He did that beautiful cover. And um, that led to working with the team from On Cooking. I came in on the fourth edition and now we're like in our eighth edition effectively. So what do we do? We have this big honking book that's meant to help a student, could be a homemaker, but it's professional students, understand the fundamentals from the, the ingredients and the science of cooking or baking, and then all the methods behind. And once you know the method, then you're able to do so many things. Like you have a, a, an understanding, I think, of a method to make soup or make mashed potatoes, boiling this starchy vegetable and puree. And a good meatloaf. And a good, oh, meatloaf too. Okay, so that's a force meat. So once you have that understanding of how to make your meatloaf, which is like a force meat, then you can make a meatball. You can make a Salisbury, uh, is, that what it, is that a Salisbury steak? I've forgotten which the, the little ovoid meatball thing. And then mm. maybe you could get experiment and make pate. Yes. Make a country terrine because that's a kind of a meatloaf. Or an English meat pie, which is a meatloaf and a crust. So the idea of teaching the method as the base is, is, gives you a lot of power, a lot of skills. So once you know how to make a vinaigrette dressing, you can make a vinaigrette dressing with any kind of vinegar, any kind of oil. Swap out yogurt for the oil. Uh, swap out lemon juice for the vinegar, et cetera, et cetera. So that is, that's really fun. And that probably is a combination of fueling my curiosity and um, is a reflection of my curiosity to be able to explain things like that. Well, you've been described as the chief explainer, right? right? That funny. Lee White, oh God bless Lee mm. White, who we love. And um, she was a food writer in Connecticut for decades and working out of Norwich and Eastern Connecticut, but a maven just all over the place. Always, there's Lee, the uh, second one from the left, just this go getter positive, interested, engaged person, always had to know what was going on, but I was her chief explainer. So it was like, you know, dial a dictionary and, you know, Priscilla, just like you had the guest with the question about the sunflower seed. I, I could, I could get the solid real answer with a few little steps over there, but I, I know what direction um, that question went in, but yes. So chief explainer, that's me. I do that. I, I do a lot of work um, in uh, use and care manuals. I've done that many years for different clients over the years. So figuring out how your waffle iron works and how do you want to make it work properly or different tools um, like that. Wow. That's amazing. My uh, folks have, uh, my mother has this toaster that made it from Connecticut to New York to Florida that goes back to the 60s when her mother gave it to her. She purchased it at uh, my grandmother from G Fox department store in Hartford, Connecticut, way, way back then. It's the only toaster that's ever been in the house. It's a two slicer, still works. And it's the thing when I go into the family kitchen, and even as a kid is the thing that I always look for. There's something about, and when we were in Florida, it's still there. It's the toaster that made the breakfasts, the toast. That's and the thing happened. never repaired, never rewired, never had to be fixed. And it's just one of those things in, a, in the kitchen that is very comforting to see. Yeah, you know? yeah. So an engineering grad... And he graduated probably of engineering school uh, mid late mid seventies, I think, give or take. He told me that when he was studying, they were introducing the concept of um, life lifespan of appliances, so that in those days, your toaster, the Amana fridge that we had from the early seventies, they all lasted 
but now it's planned obsolescence because in order to increase profitability, your freezer's got your fridge has got to break every so many years so that you can buy a new one to keep the cash flow. Uh, very sad fact, but there are many, many things like that. I, I, we have an iron still that's an ancient relic that still it's, works. It's still and, going. And lots of people have those waffle irons too. Mm -hmm. that are, that's so cool. And the wiring is good. Like the cord isn't frayed or anything on mom's right. toaster. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. everything's still the same. Absolutely. And not a scratch on it. Shiny and just love, love, love that. Back when they did make things to last, like you said. We, we have a, a, a Swiss made, it's Zlis brand, Z L I S S. That's a brand that we know. It's a hard plastic um, potato cutter. So it's, you lift up this lever and it's got this grid, metal grid, you know, you put the potato in and you ram it down. And that's from 1969 or something. Pla it's this very hard plastic. Works fine. Need some French wow. fries, drag the thing out. I just love that. Don't you? How ha Absolutely. <laughs> How has technology and the advancement of technology helped in the work that you do? Or do you prefer to blend in a little of that new school with the old school manual ways of well uh, let me just tell you there is a marble mortar and pestle next to a cuisinart food processor on the counter so get the visual image mortar and pestle think ancient rome right yes and then you have a cuisinart next to it so so we do embrace both technologies we also at the moment have a an induction cooktop on top of our gas stove. So covering two burners is this induction cooks to cooktop. We've had a very long time. Um, we actually had that in our, our, our a, an induction stove in one of our restaurants. So induction is um, based on electricity and magnetic. So the electricity magnetizes through magnetic uh, cookware and that's where the heat is generated. So the heat is only generated through the vessel, not the cooktop. It's energy efficient. And you may have heard that in California, they're talking about having induction as the, um, the cooking of the future. I think that's a fantastic technology. I've used it for 30 plus years. I love, love that. So that's modern. You do need all magnetic cookware. So our beautiful copper that we use is not, um, doesn't work, but we have carbon steel. And I was, I brought some show and tell. Ooh, you know, cool. Yeah, this is carbon steel. That's a steel pan. It's um, not cast iron, so it, do, it does rust, but it, you can you, you develop a patina on it. And this is like a, this is like a nonstick pan to us. We have these in all different sizes. So that works on induction. You know, I had an uncle for the longest time. He's no longer with us now, but he had this for years, this big cast iron pan. Mm -hmm. And he would make his bacon and the eggs and everything in it and he would that there that pan <clears throat> he wouldn't necessarily um it never went into a dishwasher he never fully scrubbed it you know mm -hmm. bone dry he said because the way you know every time he was cooking the bacon and the grease and just the pan was absorbing those flavors which would add to whatever the next thing that was being cooked in it uh, that's a whole. Is yeah, that a it's, it's a fantastic art and device. So cast iron on the microscopic level, the surface has little divots and um, you season it and the oil fills those in and creates kind of like a polymer base. Uh, my word, it's not technically polymer, which is a plastic, um, but a base that makes it so slick and wonderful. Cast iron is just brilliant. I, I, I wasn't one of those people that that collected it, but I, I have a huge respect for people that use that um, all the time. We, we actually have an old cast iron pan in the bottom of the oven. And for some baking, you need steam. And I just throw a cup of boiling water in the heated oven and the steam bursts up and it makes your bread crispy on the outside. So I do use that. Um, you also have a fantastic newsletter uh, living a flavorful life newsletter. Tell us about the, when you created the newsletter and some of the cool things that people can enjoy. And, and here's some information. You can jot that down, get your pen and paper. That's the uh, way to subscribe, the actual Thanks. physical <laughs> link. My website, you know, I, I, uh, I invite you to join. And I'm, I, it's, it doesn't come out that often every other month or so. And it's really my musings, um, always with the mission 
to help you become bold, curious, and confident in the kitchen. Because cooking is not a, um, it's not for the elites, it's for all of us. It can be the simplest thing, it can be the most complex, and it's, it's given me such satisfaction in my life. Um, and it's so important for our health and our sociability and all those things. So that's what living a flavorful life is. It's for you. It's not just for me. It's for all of us. Uh, so, you know, I talk a little bit about some adventures I might I may have had if I've had an interesting tasting somewhere or traveled, you know, locally, abroad, whatever. Some recipes. I owe my, my group of friends in my newsletter of sourdough rye loaf. I will have that recipe next. I will have it today. I mean, I've just, you know, to write a recipe requires some paying attention and double checking and things like that. Um, so there'll be some baking recipes and something savory. Some baking is savory too. It may not be. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm trying to keep it seasonal. And then um, I have a thing called Take Five where I mentioned anchovies. Take five is just my um, way of, these are the, the bullet points of things that you want to know so you feel comfortable with seasoning salts or olive oil or, or anchovies, which is the one I'm going to be doing next. Um, but yeah, you, they can just go to my website. If you if you spend a minute on it, the invitation to- It's all come up. comes up, you know how that is. But I don't have ads. I'm, I'm, I don't yeah, think no. myself one of those spammers. If, no, um, no, no, no. It's, it's a beautiful oh. site, right? It's easy to navigate. Yeah, yeah. It's, Maureen's watching in Arizona and she says, uh, my son-in-law makes a mean sourdough baguette <laughs> and some pretty awesome bagels. I'm so happy he really? married my daughter. Sourdough, right? you know, during the, during Lucky the pandemic, me. so many people made sourdough bread in I their know. downtime, huh? I did. And I did Zoom sour, Zoom bread baking classes for a friend and her friends. It was really fun. I did figure out how to drag the laptop into the kitchen and do demos at the kitchen table. And it was really great. It was, it was a way to connect. I think it's fantastic. And I took, I'm trying to think, I think I, I, I often go on these food history lectures and different things myself online. I haven't taken a cooking class online myself, but I wouldn't be against it. And even still, um, but I, I am curious to be with people again, aren't you? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Like break bread. And <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Kathleen's in New York City. She wanted to know, is there a brand of nonstick pans that you think works better or best? Um, I don't, I, I'm not necessarily going to uh, pitch a brand. Charlie just came home with, I think, an Anilon one from a local store to replace one that was scratched. Um Moviel and um, Bourgeois are French companies that make them. There's the Swiss Diamond. Um, those are all good brands. Um, Anilon is probably a pretty broadly available one. You want one with a, a coating that is more of like an enamel type finish. I'm a yeah. little scared of Teflon and the high, you know, our tendency to go to high heat and then it releases those uh, fumes, that's very dangerous. So you want to be yeah. careful about that. Yeah. Same thing with the silicone. You know, silicone is great for all kinds of cooking. I use silicone um, spatulas. I don't yeah, bake on my silicone mats. You know, those are for baking. I roll I roll out the dough and that, and I, I don't put the silicone mat in the oven. And I use those little silicone molds generally to, like I'll put a, a, a batter in and freeze it. I won't um, bake in them just because I'm concerned about the chemicals that are released. About the chemicals as well. Yeah, uh, you have a garden, right? You get Every year there's yeah, this garden. And what's I in do, yeah. Priscilla's have, garden usually? Have, what do you like nine to Nine raised beds and nine raised, yeah, five, yeah, nine total. So in the back garden, which is older, are the, the, the sage, the rosemary, excuse me, the, um, tarragon, the chives, all the perennial herbs that can continue in New England because it's cold here. And that's where our wood oven is, where I make paella and mm. we do pizzas and a lot of roast grilling because those wood ovens are fun for that. And then in the front, right next to the groundhog's burrow, <laughs> this is not good, is the lettuce and the Swiss chard and the, I love the fancy French green beans, the skinny ones and carrots and I'll put, I'm going to put a little more wildflowers out in that garden this year, just to give me a little wow. bit of a break. So yeah. many great, great local farms might as well support them. My, my tomatoes haven't been as good as they used to be. So 
I'm and buying. you like to do that. You like to travel and, and patronize a lot of different places and go on little yeah. junkets to discover yeah. in your travels, right? right. The freshness. I mean, it's a question of me uh, worrying about watering X times a day and weeding or picking the bugs off the tomatoes or me running into town to the cool local farmer, buying his tomatoes and then making something that I can share with you. What That's the choice I'd rather make, you know, what? So that's, that's the choice I've been making. You know, I have to tell you something because one of my friends said, you've got to talk about the muscles. Did I tell you about that? You Are you intuitive? <laughs> that's what I was going to bring up next. next. I was going to segue <laughs> to the seafood. Okay, I didn't and, want to, we couldn't I, forget that in honor of my dear she's friend. Also, she's, she's intuitive. <laughs> okay, there you go. Look so, wow. you know, you talk about the restaurant. This is mussels cooked with cream and curry. We serve this in the restaurant from the beginning to the end, and we still serve it to friends. It, and it always kind of tasted the same. Sometimes they would all be, you know, in the shell, yeah. in like a big bowl, sometimes laid out like that where it's a little fussier. And basically, you saute onions and you add a nice quality curry powder, something that, that appeals to you, whatever combination, you know, could be a branded one. Um, and then some white wine and you make a very, and, and heavy cream and a very dense kind of an essence of creamy curry. Then time to make the mussels, put cleaned mussels in a pot, a little bit more wine and a big dollop of that base, steam it, remove them and fuss around with them on the plate, reduce the sauce, check the seasoning, pour it over. It's so delicious mm. and it's not really that difficult. And then I, I put the grill, the bread was on a panini grill, you know, to get the little grill marks yeah. and uh, that's on my website. I make it and the, we had dinner with this uh, friend Francine the other night and she was talking about that. So she'll come over in a few weeks and we'll make it for her again. Oh, that's so nice. Are you yeah. going to have heart do baguettes so well. too? <laughs> well, you can do that with clams you could do it with clams and sausage, but oh, that is yeah. actually a traditional dish um, from France. So, yes, absolutely. And that heart baguette, which I showed earlier. Okay, so that's like you can see that's actually two to make that. It's two baguettes. So you've rolled the two baguettes out, and they've mm -hmm. they've they've proofed. They're they're ready to go in the oven, and then you just curl the two together and roll those tips on each end and you can make that heart shape and score it. And Charlie first did that for me for Valentine's day. And we continue uh, to do that. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's great. Huh? Yeah. yeah it's that, fun. People, I think bakeries are doing that now where well, he did that a long time ago. Way before. Uh, well, yeah, you know. and another thing that I love to look for, if you, the, the uh, Maureen's uh, son-in-law, I believe is the baker. Yes. Awesome. You'll be, you know, you'll make a loaf of long fermented bread. You know, it could be sourdough, just a long fermented bread with the holes and you'll cut the slice and you'll get a heart shape. It is the coolest thing. It's kind of like finding a four leaf clover. It, when you get that in your bread, you can find it in bread from a bakery too. I love that. So I'm always on the lookout. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, Jen Barry's watching in Pennsylvania. She says, Priscilla, what is your take on the different cooking sprays that you can spray in the pans before you cook? You know, some of those over-the-counter sprays. Sure. And all. Jen, Jen, it's really funny that you should mention this because I just found a can in the spinner, you know, lower cabinet. And again, I don't like the idea of, a, you know, this, this product with those volatile chemicals to make it aerated. But I have been using it because I bought an inferior parchment paper. We bought the store brand of parchment paper. Now, parchment paper is supposed to have a non-stick finish on it. And this doesn't, so I've been using it. But, but I truly, I prefer instead to take a pastry brush, you know, those washable ones with a silicone. Just put a little oil in um, a, a ramekin and then you brush it. So we're not, we don't have the can that's a pollutant and we don't have those volatile sprays. And I can't really think, I mean, I suppose if I was doing some fancy bunt cake with a very, you know, one of those bunt pans with lots of curves, I might be tempted where I have to use it, but I'd always try not to for the reasons um, that are more environmental. Which makes total <laughs> sense. Merlin's watching in Ontario, Canada. She said, what flowers are edible? 
Oh boy, this is she's, Merlin. That's a really great question. There was a cookbook author who mentioned an inedible plant in her pace, her baking book, maybe 20 years ago, they had to pull the book off the shelves. So edible, uh, okay, always when they're grown organically, of course, um, roses, violets, uh, pansies, violas, little spring flowers, lilacs, uh, daisies, uh, chamomile flowers. What else can I think of? Um, I think some people eat dandelion. Dandelion, absolutely. You eat the greens. You don't eat the flowers. They're bitter. But yes, you can take the petals off. Um, the petals, you know, scattered. You'll see that in Indian cuisine a lot, tossed. Yeah. That's a pretty healthy number. But lilies of the valley, 100% inedible poisonous. Okay. So violas, violets, roses, daisies, chamomile. That's a good assortment. Lilacs. Okay. Good. <laughs> Some people delve into, in certain cultures, um, with insects, chocolate cover, things of that nature. Did you ever get into that? Uh, I haven't. I have not prepared them. I have eaten a cricket. I have also eaten invasive cr little mini crabs. You eat the whole thing. I'm not. I'm not against it. I think that um, culinarily, we might eat certain cuisines, like the crickets are part of the cuisine in Oaxaca and different parts of Mexico. I think we're probably first going to see insects going into the feeding system for other animals that we might eat, like maybe poultry feed for our eggs, that sort of thing before they become a culinary product. That seems to be the direction with the exception of like the grasshoppers and the crickets that are part of those indigenous cooking. Um, I haven't heard too much about, Oh, how great, you know, um, a wide variety of insects are that they're going to add. They tend to be like added as a binder, um, you know, protein source and that sort of thing. I'm not against it. I'm, it's fine. What are some of your favorite things to eat? What what does Priscilla like? If, what's your go-to food, your go-to meal for yeah, you? Funny. So so for me, I mean, God, I love so many things. I do love eggs. It's so weird how I got yeah. into eggs. Yeah. I don't really like fried eggs, but I, I, I found a whole bunch of photos in my camera that I took of things like sauteing greens and seasonings and cracking an egg in the middle and putting the lid on and just kind of steaming it, frying up some leftover rice from a restaurant or stir fried rice or black rice or red rice and making that the same way. So I have a whole egg. I can keep myself very busy with eggs or a poached egg on a beautiful salad mm. or a poached egg on seasonal asparagus or mayonnaise on hard boiled egg. One of my absolute favorite Ooh, things. Oh, I've not tried anchovy. that. Wow. With an anchovy, hard boiled egg. It's a French, it's yeah. called Dure Mayonnaise. It's a French uh, sort of uh, truck stop appetizer. Yeah, Three right. Hard boiled eggs on the plate and fresh mayo over it. And then I put the anchovy. So that's high on my list. I adore mushrooms. I have a little bit of knowledge, enough to satisfy me of, of harvesting mushrooms. I love sauteed mushrooms on foods, on chicken, on a, on a, you know, a buttery tart shell galette. Um, oh God, cookies are my terrible. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's the worst. yeah. Yeah. So right um, what do, what do you create in the cookie department? Oh man. I just did cookies for friends. Uh, it was a memorial for a dear friend oh, and I made um, yeah. very dense, almost, uh, I guess you could say, or flourless chocolate cake type brownie. Ooh. Cut them into little fingers so they're smaller, which means you eat two instead of one. And I love shortbread of any kind, all yeah. kinds of shortbread. Yeah. I, I, I had a, an oatmeal shortbread that was made by a Scottish chef. I haven't quite aced that one. I'm trying to recreate it. It's not terribly sweet, but I love shortbread. I love to make an espresso shortbread that I dip half in chocolate. Um, yeah. You know what I love too? Uh, I love peanut butter. I, I could even scoop it just out of the jar. I love peanut butter. Chunky, chunky. Yeah. It's a really good snack though. It's an okay. It, yeah, it'll fill your stomach if it's uh, in the evening and you're getting hungry and you don't want to make something big. Yeah. A scoop yeah. or just, yeah. just, I love the flavor of peanut butter yeah. and just the whole. 
I do that with almond butter also. I do. I really, yes. I, feel, I should have asked you it the same way, the peanut same. butter. Yeah. yeah but the cookies, nice. I'm telling you all those tricks. Anybody who thinks I have a trick. Yes. Putting them in a tin, wrapping them in plastic and putting them in the freezer in the basement. I know the route. So I just can't have them. No, I'm terrible. Yeah. <laughs> can't have them in the house. No, I'm just terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They'll just disappear or <laughs> it's, just, it's really bad. <laughs> that is funny. I, love ice cream too. I love ice cream. Oh yeah. And you know what? You'll laugh. It's just so old school. Uh, I love custard. Oh, I love a, 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 just a homemade. My mother makes it. Uh, I just love a good homemade custard. Um, huh. Yeah. So she makes old school plain vanilla custard in the little yes. part dish her mother passed it down and exactly yeah i love cu custards and uh puddings i love that as well all that so i save you know all the jars from the um european yogurt first i used to oh, save yeah. them. i would go i spent extended period of time in france and italy so i would bring them home i probably have 40 of them and then i make uh, one thing called chocolate cream it's a 18th century recipe like a chocolate mousse made with cream, chocolate, wine, and rosemary. And that's very special. So I, I make it, I use it for that or little trifles, little banana pudding. But I have not made old school American custard since I was a kid. I love that idea. We should do that. My Aunt Gertie always making these fabulous cream puffs and the whip, the whipped cream from scratch yeah. too. And there's nothing like the, the homemade whipped cream. It's lighter. It's just. Yeah. So your it was your aunt that made the cream puffs. Cause my grandmother, that was one of her food groups and yes. she would come from her house yes. with them in a dress box. So the tissue paper is, you know, back in the day, you didn't run out and buy a new Tupperware or whatever for, you know, design purpose design box. So she would take a dress box and you knew when she had the dress box, when she got out of the car, that it was all little cream puffs, all dusted with powdered sugar. Yeah. Favorite yeah. thing. <laughs> Favorite thing. I don't make them enough. I really should. Oh, a lot of that on, especially on my mother's side, my mother is the youngest of like 16. So, uh, really? you know, cooking and baking and, and a lot of that passed down over the years from, you know, the generations, which I think is such a, such a cool and beautiful thing. And uh, why do we have such a love affair for food? What is it about food that really just gives us food and music that there's just provides such sense of history and, and comfort and, you know, well, it is comfort. I mean, it's, it's, it's sustenance. So it's the very first thing we know means keeping us alive. So we crave it from, you know, birth. It's, it's, it, it makes us people. It makes us alive. But then it immediately is a social thing, as you say. So it's something about sharing and convivial. We're usually around a table, at least traditionally. For my, my upbringing and your upbringing, we sat down with our families or, or our friends and shared a meal. It's a, we're more fractured in the way uh, people live today. People, two, two income families, people, everybody working, you know, one person's eating this meal that they ordered from DoorDash and somebody's on a diet eating a cup of yogurt. So it's a little fractured. And I'm, I'm concerned about how we reintroduce the traditional ways when people may not be able to have that luxury of sitting down. They may have to, sitting down around a table, maybe something that could only be done once a week. So I am concerned because the art of the table and the dining and the communication over meals uh, is, is really important. And I think that somebody asked me to, to talk about this, so I'm going to segue. I think that's impacted how service is presented in restaurants today. And of course, there's great restaurants like Sweet Green or Chipotle. You know, you go up to a counter, you get some cool food and you sit down, and you bring it to yourself. And service isn't really what I'm talking about. And once you've accepted that, it's hard for people to know what real service is, where the person who's bringing you the meal, um, their performance of the service is part of the dining experience. And it could be very friendly and they might you might learn their name or it may be just not frosty, but a little bit removed so that you can experience it, an evening 
at the table. And, um, and it's very different today because we don't have one standard and, and we have a lack of, of uh, people in the industry for many reasons. So how are they going to get trained? Do you sometimes like to go just to a simple diner too and just yeah, relax? I, yeah. Yes. Now, maybe not a diner. I have this, I've talked about my sense of smell with the potato water. Yes. Uh, I'm not terribly fond of the smell of a griddle. <laughs> so have, and, I, and I listen, I did the breakfast shift when I was a chef of the you, North. You so, did. Uh, I did the breakfast shift many times. So I know about the griddle um, and it was okay. But I, I, it has to be a certain kind of place. So, yes, a local, there's a place in Ivoryton, the Ivoryton Tavern, I think it's called. Mm. It's a local mm -hmm. restaurant with a big bar in the middle. Families go there. They, you know, they do chicken pot pie and. Mm roast beef and burgers. And I love that kind of a place. Simple, simple. Do you so, like comfort food? I do. I do. Yeah. Pot pie so good. Yeah. What yeah. else I crave? And like, not everybody can identify with it. If you haven't had it, I crave like a tea room, like an old oh, yeah. tea room yeah. with sandwiches yeah. on sliced bread. Yeah. They, it's not like I really grew up with that, but I no, did gone to some in my life where just something really plain, you know, a cup of tea and a chicken salad sandwich, old school, small scale too. That's, that's something I'm going to write about. I've done the photos of um, different size dinnerware. Yes. Shocking, shocking. Like my grandmother's dinner plates, which we ate off, I mean, off of in the eighties. And then some of the groovy restaurant plates that I have and the different size. That's so cool. I huh? see. So do you, you're really collecting a, those and hanging yeah, on to those. Yeah, that's you need to so do. great. Merlin in Ontario, Canada, has another question. So, what do you think of? Is it tartare with the or, e? Right, tartare, or is it tartar, tartar sauce. like in tartar sauce, uh, Merlin? I love tartar sauce with fried yeah. clams, and I love tartare steak tartare and tuna tartare. So I, so it's a thumbs up on tartar and tatar. <laughs> yeah, you, you 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 win with both there, and also tuna. There it is, tuna. Yeah. That's, that's poke, like poke, you know, poke yes. style or um, or tuna tatar style. So that you got to get that absolutely sushi grade, super fresh tuna. You've got to go to a real fish market, you know, to and know that it's super fresh and. Um, doubly clean hands and counters and keep it cold and just it cuts like butter it cuts so easily into nice nice little cubes and yeah. it doesn't have a lot of seasonings just some a little soy tamari mixture and yum 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 that's a dish that we don't is that have. on avocado that it's sitting on and the, the avocado is diced mm. and the avocado i season up a little more with um, garlic and and ginger the, that, that one usually has the higher seasoning to the tuna and then you eat it together. I love that dish. I'm very conscious again of whether the tuna is a sustainably caught one. So we don't, we try not to have it unless we can get the right, the right type. Um, yeah, that's so important as well. Yeah. You know, you also had an opportunity to uh, do some things with Sarah Moulton on Food Network and yeah. Lifestyles of the Rich of the Famous. Oh my gosh, you remember had him? You on. Yeah, Robin Leach. Robin Leach. I can remember that. I can see it. And I wish I have it on the VHS tape. We'll have to have it transferred. Again, I got to talk about almonds. It was super fun. And another guy that was really engaged and could have a conversation about almonds, you know, and it was it was great. He was he was a gas. There was no champagne involved. I don't I don't recall that. <laughs> yeah. That was fun. Sarah's a lovely person. I've known her a long, long time. We belonged, or I don't belong any longer, but a group called Les Dames d'Escoffier. It's women food professionals. But since I live up in Connecticut, we don't have a chapter. So it's hard for me to participate. Um, that's one thing about our, our lovely state. We're just, we're in the neck between Boston and New York. Yes. Yeah. 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 Make, our own, make our own world here. Uh, Terry Ann, 58 Mapes, she says, my favorite and simple meal is beans, fried potatoes, and cornbread. Oh, Great wow. comfort food. Yeah. Huh. Cool. How did she make the beans, Terry Ann? Yeah, tell us how you make it. And Merlin has uh, sort of circled back, and she's talking about the tartare. She's talking about the, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it is one of my food groups that I like very much. I tend to want to have it at a good restaurant where I know 
it's well prepared. And then usually restaurants have the access to um, really good quality beef. Not that consumers don't, but again, you've got to have a good butcher that you know is reliable. So I've had places that wouldn't mean anything to anyone listening, but different places around us. And I always like to have it with um, the waffle fried potatoes or you know, mm. made waffle chips, that sort of thing. Do, yeah. Does she like it? Merlin, did you like steak tartare? Do you like steak tartare, Merlin? Let us know. And uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah. cool. To make it from a Belgian guy named Jean Cordier in the eighties, um, and you and he learned we learned to make fries his way. In, in Belgium, they fry the potatoes three times. Mm. First to blanch them and start to cook them. Once more to then develop the crust, and then right be before serving the third time, and they're really brown and crisp. You mentioned the mayonnaise when I was on a TV project a couple of times in the Netherlands. They don't necessarily use the ketchup like we do in America for the French fries. They use the mayonnaise, mm -hmm. yeah, which was yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Different flavor mayonnaises too. You ever make that from scratch? Yeah, mayonnaise, it's on my website. so stupidly easy. This one way that was perfected with a blender or an immersion blender. And most people have a blender. And if you, an immersion blender too. So you have a, in an immersion blender, you have a narrow beaker, plop an egg in there, a couple of teaspoons of lemon juice, some salt, and you pour in a cup of uh, usually a vegetable oil or a light olive oil because olive oil can overwhelm the flavor. So maybe half light vegetable oil and half olive oil. Put that immersion blender in there, push the button, and in about one minute or less, you have mayonnaise. So I'm not, I mean, we do purchase mayonnaise, but really we could make our own all of the time. Mm. It's, it's, yeah. It's mm -hmm. funny. I, I read though that um, younger generations, certainly, you know, Gen Z, very young, and, you know, pe maybe people under 40 really don't like mayonnaise. They have an aversion to it. Yes. Right. So yeah. it's bad guys. You're missing out on something. Fresh mayonnaise, when you dilute it a little bit, is this instant creamy, wonderful sauce. Yeah so good it but is salsa you know fresh fresher like uh pesto and um, chimichurri and those vibrant bright herbal vinegary sauces i think that's more the newer younger culture where the palate has been exposed to really bold flavors which i adore but not to the exclusion of a range of taste as exactly. you can see i kind of like to eat yes <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna load up a bus of our levities. We're coming to your place. <laughs> we'll, we'll take one of each of everything you said today. We'll take one of each. Come on, here we go. Here's this too. Tell us about yeah. this. So Emile Ari, many people know that company. It's a French company from Burgundy, and they are famous for their clay uh, bakeware and casseroles and things. And they have this whole line of covered bakeware for making breads. And I've had the opportunity to work with them for, I don't know, five, 10 years. And I've done all kinds of recipes and their use booklets because I'm, I know how to crack these things and figure out how to make them work the best. So my favorite, um, they, they have this baguette mold, you know, which makes three baguettes and you put the lid on and you, you take the lid off and bingo, you have this beautiful crusty bread. But I like that vessel and another one that's oval shaped. So you can make this giant two pound loaf of bread in your home oven. And suddenly you've made this bakery loaf of bread in a home oven, last you a week, you know, maybe it's a, if it's a big family, well, your family, your mom's family would have need several, <laughs> but you know, a bigger family, maybe make two. And it's just make, makes baking very accessible and that crusty earthy bread. So I really love the work that they've done. Um, and um, they also have this neat mold that is uh, eight, eight rolls of bread together. So it makes this crown shaped loaf that's very, very decorative and fun. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun with that. Wow, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, I mean, What's it's that? funny because I also bake on a baking stone. That's our standard. We have a very thick baking stone the size of a sheet tray. And that's the, the base that we use most of the time. How has how has cooking changed from what you've seen? What are some of the things that are the rage now that are popular now? You mentioned some of the you know the pestos and different things of that nature. What are some other things that are um, in vogue today? Right. Well, there's so much fusion. I mean, fusion was a bad word. Fusion cooking was a word from the 70s 
and, and Wolfgang Puck at Spago in California was the person who really, you know, pr promoted this. So he's the guy that put smoked salmon on pizza. That was fusion food. Well, fast forward to today, and we have so many different cultures that are part of our country. You know, you've got Korean Americans that are making tacos, you know, so you've got a kimchi taco and all those things. And that's not new, new. That's already probably ooh, 10 years old. But that's reached the home level, this mixture of cooking like that. And I just love it. I mean, I love the hot, sour flavors that come out of Korean food. And I love soup dumplings that you get out of, you know, uh, China, mainland China. So people are making dumplings at home and it might be a, you know, uh, or it could be like a, a, a brisket kimchi spring roll, you know, this, this whole, whole mixture of things. So you've got that as one influence. And then I love the, the, uh, fr the vegetable forward food. So it might be a grain bowl of some kind or, you know, a salad where you, you can roast and, and sear your butternut squash and make it all caramelized and delicious. And you plop that on some kind of a, a rice and all, um, you know, edamame soybeans and blanched spinach and a really yummy dressing and this kind of fresh, uh, heartwarming, flavorful food. But at the end of the day, it's all plant forward. Mm -hmm. So I'm really loving that. And even Charlie, you know, my other half who's been on this earth a little bit, quite a bit longer than me and loves his, you know, steak and potatoes. He, he enjoys these dishes that I create. So I think there's a lot of possibilities for us to expand our, um, our eating palate. Are you always experimenting? You are a, in addition to all these other things I mentioned, a recipe developer. Yeah. So the recipe development is experimenting, but often with a mission. So for me, me, you know, I come up with a mission. So what's my mission? Um, I'm, I'm, it's, you, you know, soup is the winter and spring is salad. So that experimenting for me will go in that direction. Now I do recipes for a newsletter for a company called Tuscan Women Cook. And that is a 25 plus year company of culinary uh, tours in Montefalonico, Tuscany, working with the Tuscan grannies. So in that case, they might give me an assignment. It might be, you know, uh, I think we want to try to make a different kind of ravioli. So I might know yeah. something and do some research and that will send me in a direction. What did we do last month? I don't want to tell you what's coming because I don't want to spoil it. But we did like cantuccine or cantucci, which is a type of Tuscan biscotti, a little bit different than ones we might be familiar with. And again, I had a recipe they provided me with from the Tuscan granny. And there were some things that needed clarification and I retested and used American flour. And you know, so, so that's how the experimenting goes. Um, and, and, it, and it could be a company sends me a box full of seasonings, you know, okay, what do you want to do? So, so it just depends what's coming my way. Is anybody else starving like I am, gang? <laughs> I mean, it's just like... <laughs> no, I know. I think I might have a glass of wine after this. I'm not hungry. I had Ooh. some problems earlier. So we didn't touch on the wines. What are some of your favorites? What do you like to pair and things of that pear, nature? I know. Well, it just depends, I suppose. Everyday drinking. I like, I like Viognier, which is a, a French burgundy wine. Um, I like white wines. I tend to for on a regular basis because the reds are just wonderful, but I often get headaches. Yes. Yeah. Um, God, but I love a red burgundy. I love Rioja. If you're eating Spanish food, you really have to have Albarino, a, a white or, you know, a Rioja because it just says Spain. Um, there's just so many wines that are just not as well known. When we had the restaurant, there, there's a traditional ways that wine is served and paired. And I, I think wine professionals still would do this, but you would start with an Alsatian wine. Those are slightly fruitier. They're not always sweet. And they're served in the cute little the German looking glasses with the green stems. So a Gewürztraminer is that spicy, uh, somewhat fruity wine, not, not totally sweet. I like to start with that. So I, I made Gravlax, which is cured salmon, like a smoked salmon, but you know, uh, cured at home, no smoking well. So that would be great with a Gewürztraminer um, and that sets your palate off. And then there, it leaves you with room to have a different type of wine for your main course. Very nice. Yeah, we're going to have, Charlie wants a steak frite, which, you know, steak and then French fries. So we make that at home once every once in a while. And I will look for 
a nice Bordeaux in our, our modest wine cellar. We'll, it'll be an occasion to open something better because we don't do that very often. But that's nice, huh? That's really nice. Uh, Maureen in Arizona watching, one of our regular faithful. She says, Priscilla, have you ever made a Dutch baby? Yes. They're so delicious. So for the audience watching right now around the world who might not know what that is, tell us what that is. Well, we'd love to know how Maureen does it, but it's yeah. a Dutch baby is a pancake. And I make it not in this one, but in a bigger one. And it is um, kind of like cream puff batter. So it's a batter with eggs little bit of sugar and flour and butter. And you combine it all and you preheat your pan. Cast iron pan is ideal or that steel pan. Pure, pure, look at that, preheat it at 425, 450. Have the batter, pour it in, bake it 15, 20 minutes or so. And the thing puffs up just beautifully. Uh, it's like Yorkshire pudding, that all those types of things. And you take it out, dust it with powdered sugar and eat it right away. Oh my God, it's so good. Love to have that with really good thick cut bacon and then um, good local maple syrup. Some, yeah. But I, I haven't had it in a couple of years. No, I'm trying, as I get older, you've got to be wiser about these special treats. But that's when we have company, you know, sleepover company. Merlin asks in Canada, do you like chef's pantry products? You know, I, I'm familiar with them. That's a, they're sold, um, it, you know, privately, I think through individuals. I think they do a nice job identifying certain, you know, whether it's a popular pan or a baking stone or a, a, you know, mold type of thing, but I've never worked with them, not for any particular reason, but I think they work very hard. The company does to um, identify things people need and make it affordable for them. That's, that's it. That's fantastic. I want to show you something. I love this shot too. Look at all those. Yeah. Now is, See what's in my hand? Look what's in my hand. That's a bowl of green almonds. And that's th those almonds are right this minute. I need to order some. That's the last stage before the almonds start to develop the tough outer hull. And there is a tradition in the countries where almonds first grew to yeah. eat them because it's the first fruit that appears. Yes. So you can put you can chomp on that between your teeth, and there's a little like a nutlet inside. It's kind of more like a grape at this point, but mm -hmm. that's what's in my hand. Yeah, that's our kitchen. Those are the pots. Um, yep, they're, they're in the kitchen right now. We use them. We use them all. Some of them are getting a little heavy for me. From the, the fourth one in, fifth one in on the left there, next to that black one, that one's really heavy. I'm, I'm not so fond of using it anymore, um, but yeah. otherwise we use all of them. I made chicken stock in the one on the right. Um, so I, I like to make chicken stock and put it in the freezer. So I'm ready for my spring soups. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, so seasonal. So what are some of the things that you're you're preparing now that we are in sort of like mid to, yeah, mid spring? Big spring. So um, morel mushrooms, hard to find, but when we can find those, I love to have them with asparagus anything with asparagus, you know, asparagus tarts, steamed asparagus, asparagus on salad, asparagus on salad with a vinaigrette made with raspberry vinegar. That's kind of a 1980s sort of thing, but it's still a very pleasant combo as well as with morel mayonnaise. That's another one I like. Asparagus frittata. So a Spanish frittata with potatoes and asparagus in it. Um, yeah, that's definitely on the rotation. And then the, the soups are now all going to be broth based. So that's what all that chicken stock is for. So, you know, maybe it's a chicken soup and at the end I throw in a ton of chives or mm. a ton of whatever's the fresh green little baby lettuces or spinach coming up from the garden. That sounds um, so good. Yeah. Cherry tomatoes go in it, that kind of thing. You know, you'll laugh, but uh, one of my favorite meals, believe it or not, is the Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner, the turkey, the mashed potatoes, yeah. the stuffing. I mean, just, I just really love and look forward to and fully enjoy every bite of that yeah. particular experience, that meal. Yeah. And, and so what's the, what's the pattern for you? Does your family make a specific stuffing? Yes, it's the bread based, but you mentioned, um, You've mentioned the meat stuffing, and I was introduced to that by a Polish friend. Her, fa her family came over from Poland, and actually they live in Connecticut, 
And uh, instead of instead of the bread stuffing, they did the meat stuffing with the sausages and all that. It was absolutely delicious. It was just the first time I had it. So my yeah. grandmother and great grandmother made a meat stuffing, and it was like pate. So, um, didn't have liver, but it was um, pork, veal, and beef, and it was dense. So the stuffing was like another whole meat product that went with the meal. I've only done that myself a few times. Uh, we've evolved our own sausage chestnut stuffing that mm. I just love. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit like the cookies. you got to get that leftover stuffing away mm. or else it's... <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just constantly... Uh... <laughs> Isn't it fun I... how, how for Thanksgiving and these other seminal meals, how we all have our own pattern and it's so personal to us I, I love hearing about the different thanksgivings yes it's you really know what i love too and i haven't had it in a long time um because it's not good for you mm. uh but uh believe it or not a really good chopped liver oh you like chopped uh, liver yeah uh, and then yeah, nah, 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 nah. i just that's not one of my things yeah I, it just I take you a sauteed chicken liver with spices Ooh. And, it and it's kind of Italian Tuscan style. Yes. I have chopped liver, like from a Jewish deli or whatever. Uh, yeah, there was a Jewish friend that made yeah, it, right? It but me. it's not really healthy. I mean, <laughs> I liver, I don't know. It's got a lot of iron. You know, it does have the fat, but it is iron. It's good for you. Yes. I love white fish salad from the Jewish deli. Oh, oh that is yeah. so good. White yeah. Fish and are you a dessert person? Are you? I know we focus a lot on the savory. Are you, do you? Oh yeah, you know? oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what will it be? <laughs> yeah, you mentioned the ice no, cream. I brought and, my book. Uh, there it yes. is. I, I brought out some of my favorite tools. So this is called a balloon whisk, and it's a big, big one. I mean, you know, um, this is a normal kind of large, stiff whisk, but a balloon. You know, it looks just like a balloon. And that way you can make whipped cream, you know, at home. You can fold in all the melted chocolate and butter into the whipped cream and the egg whites to make your chocolate mousse. You And I make these lemon mousses and lemon mousse torts where there's a sponge cake and a layer of lemon mousse and other things. So this is like, you know, when we bury me in my uh, fancy, I don't know, copper casket, <laughs> me and my whisk. <laughs> This is one of my favorite tools. So, yes, desserts. It desserts. doubles uh, <laughs> as her microphone, too. When there she you go. Oh, that was so nice. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> a... <laughs> oh my God. Do you do a lot of uh, speaking desserts. engagements and uh, appearances and things yes, of that I nature guess. as well? I mean, COVID has, has interrupted all Sort of stopped. Yes. Yeah. I've done lots of different things. You enjoy that? I do. Yeah, like you do, but different. Different. I like to, I, I think it's, I hope people are being brought in. It's just not us babbling, but making them think about what, what we're inspiring them to think about food because yes, you know, what do you, what do you want to try to make? You know, what, you know, what haven't I cooked before? What, what Sherry what likes what? liver and onions. There you and go. Okay. In, uh, yeah, you just touch the one the liver, the chicken liver, the, the rare beef liver. I, I cooked it kidneys. I can cook it all. Kidneys, I can probably eat, but the liver, just pate, foie gras, I can eat all that. But no, liver. Erlen says herring it. salad. Yeah, love really herring. good. Love Kathleen it. in New York City says, I actually had tried oh. fried gator bites once at a fair. Chewy, like chicken, right? <laughs> I'm almost certain. I've had I've had gator, and it's another one that's definitely like chicken. I had I had horse meat. In Sweden, I was at a beautiful smorgasbord restaurant. I mean, you know, by appointment to the king type of place. Lovely. And when I went for the second course, you each course, um, you go up and to the buffet and take it, sit down, they clear your plate, you go to the next one. And I saw this really pink meat that made me think of prosciutto. Oh, I, I, knew, yeah. I thought of something. I sat down, I had it on my fork and my host said, well, you know what that is. And as it went to my nose and in my mouth, I realized what it was. And it was a little bit sweet in a way that was not appealing. And, you know, that was that. Mm. So, yeah, liver, chicken liver rare and beef liver I'm not so fond of. And I won't do horse meat. Uh, um, again, if I can bison <laughs> is amazing. Bison is. Bison, that, that yeah. rich, rich flavor, yes. And, yeah. and grass-fed beef, you know, if you have the, um, you can afford the luxury because it's a little more expensive, 
grass-fed beef has a beautiful rich flavor. You have to cook it at a lower temperature. It's leaner and a lower temperature so it cooks through without getting too tough and you want to eat it rare. Um, yeah. How do you feel about, I, I would imagine, uh, sugar substitutes and all that kind of stuff. You're, you're, well, I'll you tell you, I was really gung-ho on monk fruit sweetener. There's a brand called. Yes, I was introduced um, to that in San Diego. Brand, which is yeah. delicious. I love it. However, recently, um, what had been considered generally recognized as safe, that's an, a specific terminology that changes every day. other day right? right well no they pulled um uh, erythritol which is often used in these um enhanced sweeteners to bulk them up yeah. so it has very bad consequences for heart health so uh, monk fruit that is you know bulked up with this erythritol is no longer considered safe so i'm sorry to say we have to pull that but erith uh, excuse me monk fruit and stevia those are those high intensity sweeteners yeah when they're alone and plain, they're natural. Of course, you use minute quantities. One of the things I recommend for people that are trying to cut back is really look at where optional sugar is. And if you pick up a jar of, you know, bottled salad dressing and that sort of thing, that's where they just throw sugar at us like crazy. And you really don't have to. And well, yeah. I tell people that you can take an old cookbook, 25 years or older. And if you've got a cookie or a brownie recipe, Nine times out of 10, you can lop out 20 to 25% of the sugar and you won't even know the difference. And again, salty taste like sweet taste, we become accustomed to it. And you just gradually reduce your use of sugar or salt and your palate will readjust. So often chefs, because they're so accustomed tasting food, tasting food, yeah. they increase the saltiness because their tolerance goes up. Um, and that's what I've been able to do. And there are people, if some of my friends are listening, where they go, well, I don't know, Priscilla, I put salt in your food. But anyway, I stand by my position. Um, I, uh, I season my food that I serve people. But, um, and, I, but I, uh, and I do reduce the amount of sugar. And you can always add the salt at the table. Um, well, there was a whole thing too, right? I, I know in some of the um, professional work I've done with PBS and elsewhere, some of the folks I've interviewed, where, you know, I think it was like the 60s, 70s, maybe early 80s, fat was made to be the culprit. And then the lobbies for sugar sort of swooped in and, and sugar then became sort of in everything because fat was the thing. Fat free, no fat, all of that. Fat was considered the culprit. But we need to have fat in our diet. We do need to have some cholesterol to, to even operate, right? Well, we've gone through the different demons. So we, you know, I guess it was, uh, was I guess sugar, you're right. Sugar came, then fat came. And now with the keto, that whole period, sugar and carbs, because sugar is a carb. Yeah. Those are being demonized. But we have to get back to whole food. Yes. You know, whole food made from real ingredients. I mean, that should be our primary focus. Yes. Now, a lot of people need to retrofit their health. They, they've, you know, they have weight issues or other health issues. So, of course, they need, you know, the, the comfort of some of these um, artificial things to help maybe help yeah. them. But, you know, whatever happened to the kid having a glass of water? Why do they need soda? Just the you glass know? of water, so, right. And our, I had this discussion with a physician from Yale and a, a friend the other night, and they were both talking about a lot of the manufactured food that we have in our lives, which I agree is terrible. But I also think we have too many eating opportunities. Yeah. You know, and and uh, that's we we don't have to eat while picking up our tires and you know, <laughs> and it's, you know oil change and a milkshake. It's it's just so weird. <laughs> <laughs> the snack machines there and right. <laughs> <laughs> it is, you go to other countries and it is changing globally but you know you, you have a photo of the street in the u.s and everybody's carrying a thermos of something or a, a, a big a big gulp coffee, or right? a super you size know, you this right, exactly you walk down a, another a street in another country and nobody is yeah. and 
we appreciate it more. I mean, I'm, listen, I'm no, I'm no uh, saint at this, but I don't usually walk around with um, drinks. It's not All like kinds that. of things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a yeah. Burrito in her I hand. I do not but... eat in the car, unfortunately. I learned that just like I know. Right. <laughs> I know how to find the wrapped cookies in the freezer. <laughs> Terry Ann 58 uh, says, I put brown beans in the pot, add baking soda, bring to a boil for 30 minutes, then let the beans cool down, wash them. They're really good. She says, I put ham bone in for flavor. And when the beans are tender, they're done. Nice. Yummy. I do love beans too, Terry. Yeah. I, I, um, I grow uh, Jacob's cattle and Great Northern and a couple other kinds of beans that become shell beans. I don't think I'm going to do them this year, but I've enjoyed those immensely. Um, although I joke that I would never survive. I mean, I think I, my harvest is like three pounds you know? <laughs> <laughs> dinner for a week and then I'm dead. That's but it, right? That. Yeah. yeah, beans are so good. So everybody probably wants to know, what did the chef eat today? Oh, Chef Priscilla. For breakfast, I had one of David Brown, artist David Brown from Old Saber, Connecticut's eggs. I did a soft boiled egg. Toast soldiers. I love soft boiled eggs. I get that from my I get that from my father. Yeah. And some people are afraid to make them. They don't know how to, they're afraid to Yeah, it's like six, seven minutes at you, you know, you want a good egg, you boil them a low boil, take it out at six minutes, you crack the top, and then you can touch and decide whether it's firm enough to your taste. I don't like any runny, runny white. So it's usually closer to seven minutes. Um, then for lunch. We had our first lunch outside on our little deck today in the sun, and we had BLTs. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a lot of bread. We're having, it was a bread day. We don't usually have this much bread, so we had BLTs. Nice tomatoes from – they were hothouse tomatoes. They were good ones. And then I had made this grab lock, grab lox, which is cured salmon and dill. Yeah. So um, we had some of that with salad, and I had made a vinaigrette dressing, um, a light a light – snacky thing because i knew i was going to have to sit and chit chat and i didn't want to be hungry but i didn't want to be too full yes. either sitting terry <laughs> answers she the baking soda is added because it helps cutting down sort of the tummy yeah. gas yeah. Yeah, the that's good and that and I, I i think i know this it doesn't do anything um doesn't toughen the beans because that's one of the big things i usually put a, a piece of dried seaweed in when i cook my beans terry ah, yeah kombu you buy it you can buy it almost anywhere now and um the enzymes in it help the beans not toughen because that's such a big deal no, nothing worse than chewy skins in the beans yeah no yeah. that's uh <laughs> yeah. i never i i don't know it goes back to childhood i i was never a fan of just plain mass-produced white bread you know like the wonder bread type stuff i sure. just never uh, and I think it goes back to, I don't know, sixth grade. And I remember this kid that sat next to me. He, his lunch was bagged. His mother made the sandwich. And there was a peanut butter jelly sandwich where the jelly was seeping through the white bread. And it was soggy. And it was just, I, I need my bread to be more firmer on the outside and softer sure. in the inside. Right, right. Versus <laughs> the other. <laughs> What did you have for school lunch? What did your mother send you into school? Oh, boy. Oh, we had, um, well, I always had a nice thermos of homemade soups, okay, which was go. really good. And uh, there would be maybe like a tuna sandwich or, and then sometimes, you know, we would, on Friday was pizza day. So you would buy, you know, the lunch and an extra 50 cents, you get an extra slice and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of times, yeah, we were, we, we are still, I mean, my mother is still, Christmas is her thing. The full Monty. We've always been surrounded by food and and desserts and pies and cookies and uh, just everything. You know, the ham on Easter and just all of the. Yeah. She still loves to uh, make the gravies and all of that. You know, we tr everybody tries to watch all of that because you can't. Um, Important. I, I spoke, I, I do some mentoring through a project called Tin Can and a young man spoke to me, college, excuse me, high school junior, and he wanted to learn to cook. And we discussed ways that he could learn to cook at home 
so he could be self-sufficient so his parents didn't have to um, you know, worry about him. But one of the things I realized that he didn't have, I didn't get the sense that he had a family that really cooked as in making gravy and things from scratch. So that was a little bit of a stump for me uh, because I realized if you don't have that, you can't pass that on if it isn't there in the family. So it's great, Jim, that you and your family have that to share and yeah. pass on. And I mean, you must have a yeah. gazillion aunts and uncles too. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all, it's all available. I love yeah, it. I love absolutely. It. Yeah. And I, the I, other thing, you know, you talk, I, I asked you about your high school and things like that or, or school lunches. So in grammar school, we had the little school lunches and, you know, I remember spam fingers. They were cut into little strips and crispy and they had a real flavor. And I remember that flavor. So at Christmas time, we tried this new spam. It was figgy pudding spam. Well, not only did it taste icky, but it didn't have any of that spam flavor. Why am I telling you this besides my confessing that I grew up and ate spam? I'm telling you this because our palate is there. It, it's in our memory, but we need to know that this matters in some way. You know, our palate is there to protect us from eating poisonous flowers and, you know, skunk cabbage that'll kill us and things like that. But it's also there, you know, to, to remind us of our old memories and growing up and things. So thinking of, and getting kids to pay attention is I think helpful. Well, I, I think that if there's ever anything, you know, God forbid nuclear that would occur, uh, I, I would say Twinkies and peanut butter and spam would probably be the things you want to take uh, into your shelter. Did you, your did you throw away things for during COVID? Did you stock up at all? You know, uh, let's see. Um, we did not go overboard on the, uh, toilet tissue i like okay. people people were you know going crazy and now they have closets filled of it and they don't know what to do with it um we made a lot of things uh mm -hmm. in the very early days we did box up a, a lot of things and bring it to pantries and shelters and places where we knew that they were going there was going to be a shortfall because there was a shortfall in uh donations people mm -hmm. just weren't going out to Sure. get anything to bring them in so we uh we did do that a lot but um yeah i mean there's always soups and just you know, and we stockpiled in the freezer you know there was the issue of whether we could get vegetables and things yes so we've, we've pretty much eaten through there was we just ate some lamb that was a good year and a half in the freezer so we're just getting through that because there was that moment where it was a question of whether we could get you know we were that was a possibility. There were basics that were all of a sudden not available, right? Yeah. We did have a lot of water. What uh, did, uh, well, all of this that occurred and, you know, there's still remnants of it, what have you, it has changed society in so many different ways and the way we operate, just the things that we're doing going forward. What are some things that uh, you've learned about yourself through this time of reflection and of uh, pausing and, and just coming out of the gate, looking at next chapter? Uh, what did Priscilla learn about Priscilla during this time? <laughs> well, I've, I'll, I'll make it more broad and I guess it's all I'm speaking. So it's about me. Certainly spending time with people you love is very important in that that one on one time, you know, uh, being with our friends and together is so, so important. We did do what I call COVID cafe. I had found a gigantic restaurant walk in a dumpster in New Haven that I had stashed in the garage. And um, around Christmas time with the first year of the pandemic, we built a fire under the walk and had an outdoor fire. And I, we had some friends over. I was the only one that loved it because I, the winter didn't bother me, but they were all cold. So the COVID cafe went away. So the, being with our friends and the luxury of having friends and being able to, or family, cook with them and spend time, time with them um, is of great value to me. And I have a real appreciation for that. So, you know, being, this feels very personal, like we're together because I haven't been spending time on screen like this as I had been for the past few years. But I think we all want to make that effort to, to um, go into our communities, support our local businesses, whether they're shops or restaurants or groceries or whatever. 
um, yeah. arts institutions. We spend a lot of um, time supporting the arts by watching them online, you know, Metropolitan yeah. Opera performances, for example, and mm -hmm. galleries and things. So yeah, that's, that's what I've learned. And then there's hot dogs. And Jen Berry <laughs> asks, how do you make a classic hot dog? Classic grill, pan, boil, fry. We grill and fry in the pan. Oh, She's well, in Pennsylvania. Jen Barry, you're speaking to my heart. I mean, too many <laughs> hot dogs have been consumed. Um, one of our, well, the preferred way, we like a brand called Hummel. I think that's oh, a yeah. brand, right? From it's Haven, a, like right? a skin, you know, so it has this thick skin. So you get mm -hmm. that snap when you bite it and boil it and then uh, pan fry it. That's indoors. It could be on the outdoor grill, but to light up the wood grill for the effort of the hot dog doesn't usually happen. <laughs> but let me tell you, there's this place in New Jersey that we learned about on food television. It's called Rutt's Hut. Have you heard about it, Jim? Yes, I have. I haven't been there yet. Okay. But yeah. So Rutt's Hut, they uh, boil them and then they deep fry them. And they, they have degrees of doneness. So the first degree is ripped. So the skin is burst. And then the full the fully cooked one's called creamed, where it's all super crunchy on the outside. So we do a version of the ruts in our frying pan. So you boil it, then you put it in the frying pan with a little bit of oil. It's not deep fried. And you just cook it, rolling it over till it bursts. So the skin is super crispy. And then you've got that great hot dog slash bologna slash mortadella flavor mm. <laughs> and on toast bun and Arnold's brand. That's a, you know, Arnold and Pepperidge farm. Those are new England brands. I think mm -hmm. like, brand. like hood. Yeah. Hood, right. These are right. Our, our, our new England brands. And this goes in the naughty, naughty, naughty category, but mm -hmm. a lot of them were consumed during COVID because yeah. Charlie came home with a big bag, you know, you get 20 hot dogs. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, yeah. oh dear. <laughs> That's it. We know what we'll yeah. be doing for a yeah. while. <laughs> I like a good New England clam chowder too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we went to with a woman named Alice Ross, who teaches historical cooking for museums like um, Plymouth Plant Plantation and Sturbridge Village. Oh, yeah. We learned to cook, make clam chowder over a wood fire. So just the most simple earthiest clam chowder, fry the bacon, take the bacon out, put the clams in, no, fry the potatoes, then put the clams in a little water, cover it, then add the cream and stuff. Oh my God. Mm. So good. So yes, mm. I like the creamy style in case it wasn't obvious from that yeah. presentation. <laughs> My father has always liked the Manhattan. He grew up in New York City. New York, so has always liked the Manhattan clam chowder. Yeah. 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 I, I really like little neck clams. Not too big. You know, the, they're called count necks. That's the specific size, kind of small. I love uh, clams with spaghetti. I love, mm. you know, clams and sausage and red sauce and crusty bread. You know, I, I think after this, you're going to have probably a, a snack with that wine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny. I, I can run a few narratives in my yeah. head. Yeah, so there's one over that... here that's involved. Actually, there's a big hunk of Gruyere. Oh, I, I was bread. just about to say, <laughs> I don't know. This is unbelievable. It's like that was I was just about to move on to one of my favorite oh, things yeah. next to the mashed potatoes is cheese i get that my mother loves cheese so that oh. has come to me i love cheeses cheese 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 how about oh you God. are you kidding yeah me? i guess that's a yes yeah, seriously it's a it's a definitely a major major weakness that i have so i love a cheese plate in the european style and it could have you know domestic cheese like arethusa farm makes a wonderful blue cheese and then Conte is a French, um, you know, Swiss cheese, if you want to call it. It's a type of Gruyere, a good Conte. So that's a hard cheese. Oh, my God. You have that on the plate. And then any of those soft rind goat cheeses or the Epois, the really smelly one, you know, that you, you have to eat it when it's just perfectly ripe. Uh, the Spanish Manchegos. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Goat I, cheese I, I will so even tell good. you, I, I, love so, I have such a broad palate for cheese. I had a vegan um, friend visit and I bought a vegan hard cheese, like a Parmesan type. Mm. Well, I think it was more like a Fontina type and a Boursin type of cheese, vegan. Yeah. The Boursin was pretty good um, because there's 
I, I need to do more research. They don't have the same proteins to get that, which help give the creaminess to cheese. Right. So I kind of like the flavor, the culture yeah. of the cashew mixture mm -hmm. had a nice flavor, but it was a little chalky. Yeah. Right. But there's still a bit left left. I'll go eat that. <laughs> <laughs> She so shall. Many things you can uh, do and you know a, a griddle it could be just a another cast iron pan on top of your pan to make your mm -hmm. grilled cheese yeah. or a panini grill we did some work with a company that made the grills so we they made the grills to those yeah panini grill because you can get it super skinny so it's just really like a vehicle for cheese mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah Everybody's going to be raiding their cupboards, cupboards if they're not now. I know there's a cheese, the cheese drawer, you know, how fridges have a cheese, uh, drawer, which is yeah. supposed to also have other stuff. Yeah, Our right. hundred percent <laughs> cheese. I think there's the miso in that drawer. Ah, uh, that it too. Is the miso and it's all cheese. Yeah. yeah. And there's always a lot of citrus too. I, you know, whether you're going to put the lemon or lime juice over a dish or grate the zest into the sugar to make the cookie or into the pie. A lot of citrus in our house. Um, I'm going to find yeah. something good to eat. After. She's going to dig in. A couple other real quick things we wanted to show. Sure. There's this as well. Yeah, that, that magazine sadly um, did fold as a print magazine, but that's some of the work I've done over the years with trade magazines. And, you know, you've heard me talk about all my work with appliance companies. Yeah. So gourmet retailer, I work with Anna Wolf, the then editor, she's now in restaurant technology industry. Um, and my, my area work was anything with a cord. So I got to go to the houseware show and review all the coffee makers and the waffle irons and the Ooh. mixers and, it was so much fun. But yeah. again, as we've seen consolidation in the way that we shop, yes, they no longer sustain a publication for the small specialty retailers like that. It's um, happening all just, over. Here's I another. Know. And that's Charlie's bread book. That's Charlie, my husband. That book's 25 years old. Wow. And um, he um, makes, after we sold the restaurant, he started making bread at home. And Gloria Pepin, Jacques' wife, was having the founder of Cuisine Art to dinner. And she said, you got to make the bread in the food processor. And he went, oh, I oh, can't do that. Mm. And he did. And he figured out a way to make this really great bread um, using a food processor, which we still do. And still I, do. I, I do, you know, he's basically retired. So I make the bread, but I make the baguette style bread and country loaves and bagels using the food processor. But um, I do make other kinds of breads in a mixer if I have lots of butter and eggs and I want to mix mm. like brioche a long, long time, I use a stand mixer. Mm. Mm. I, I love the, the, the way, you know, as a wordsmith and a, and a communicator myself, I just love listening to the way you describe it all. Thank just the, the melodic way that you describe uh -huh. the foods and oh, the, well, yeah, it's, really it's very, that. very, um, Delicious. <laughs> Anytime. Yeah. You know, you can call me on a one, one subject uh, thing, but yeah, no, I really, and I, I have to say, I taught food. I teach food writing at Gateway. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, I teach at Gateway Community College in New Haven, which is a community college yes. in that county. Each county has right one. Downtown, and yeah. uh, food writing and the students, you know, I've, I've taught it eight times, eight years. They loved it. You know, they really, really loved it. Adult yeah. students and traditional age students. But sadly, the enrollments for the advanced courses are a little down as we're recovering from the pandemic. Right. So I haven't taught it in a semester. But that's, you know, where I, I spend time thinking like this. Well, I appreciate your spending the time with me and us here on the Jim Masters Show live series, Priscilla. This was really fantastic. We chatted for, would you believe, two hours and 10 minutes? No way. Yeah. It's it's two Come hours on. and ten minutes. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> it's the ten after ten. The cat hasn't come in? No, no way. I can't believe it. It, it doesn't feel like every guest says, because I try to make it warm and conversational and interactive, that it never feels like the time that slips by. But did you intend for us to speak for two hours? <laughs> I never intend any time. I just let oh it roll God. and whatever okay. happens because. Oh, you're some, wild. This is crazy. Thank some, you. I just let it roll because, you know, if the guest has the time, I just let it roll yeah. because <laughs> it, some nuggets happen, some beautiful yeah. things yeah. transact Thank from you. the interaction and the conversations. So That's absolutely terrific, huh? 
that's so sweet. Thank you so much, Jim. Ah, the pleasure is all mine. And pleasure. here's the website, everybody, PriscillaMartel.com to learn all about what we've talked about and then some. It's a phenomenal well, you, site. And you've got a new Lovity, right? Is that what I... You I are definitely now? a Lovity. They uh -huh. said that right off the top in the yeah. beginning. They said Priscilla is definitely a Lovity. Oh, and you know, I, I say to all the guests... There are Emmys and Oscars and there's Tonys and Grammys and Tellies and Peabody's and all these fabulous things you can garner. But how does it feel to be a lovety on the Jim Master show? There you, you go. There you, you yeah. go. I That's it. it. Everybody usually says their feet start tingling. Are your feet tingling right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my ears are. <laughs> One of our guests said that he was levitating. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Well, I can't think of a more pleasant Monday evening than chit-chatting and getting to explore corners of our food tastes together. And it's been yes, awesome. really, really it fun. was. And I hope we get to, well, we're going to try to do a dinner. Get together, exactly, you know, to, yes, together yeah. and, yeah. and real life. But uh, somebody that pops in, just want to say a little hello. Mr. George Burns always oh pops God. in on the show. Oh, my my aunt was. up in, uh, one of my mother's sisters, actually, in West Hartford, Connecticut, which was a tremendous collector of serious, serious dolls, very expensive, real, like oh. one of a kind type things. And she was able to collect the George Burns doll. So over the time, my cousin said, Jim, would you like to have, you know, sort of passed down the George Burns? And I said, absolutely. And I put him on, we did a nostalgic episode, you know, two, three years ago. And I Put him on and everybody fell in love with George. So he pops in and says his sends his love and lovity to you as well. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Oh, he was something else. George he's got George. his cigar. He's got his red uh, pocket square. He hangs down below with his martini. Okay. And he's, he's right. sort of like an associate producer. Yeah. <laughs> he keeps everything under control. This is great. My dad would have loved that. My dad was a big uh, uh, My dad wrote jokes for Arthur uh, Godfrey. Did he really? Back the beginning of his career, which would have been in the 40s. Is that crazy or what? So I'm so glad I brought the George Burns out to spur yeah. that because that's something I didn't know. I yeah. think that's in yeah, yeah. My wow. Dad was, my dad was a drummer in a big band and then he had a music store and uh, then he became this wild car guy. He would have um, loved this. He would have loved Oh, this is right up the alley, right? He well, loved he he's watching he knows i, I told he's, you i have an oscar i've got the best oscar um, from, daughter oscar it's right up there absolutely yeah Abs well maureen says uh this has been a wonderful evening in lovety hall as they call it good thing you can't hear my tummy rumbling i've gotten hunger and hungrier during the conversation thank you priscilla this for being true. with us right. jane's watching in sweden one of our regulars really? in sweden. Wow. thanks for being oh, here I tonight tell jane i was the spokesperson for absolute vodka for two years Really? Taxamuka. It was the best gig I ever had. Oh my God. I would think so. <laughs> yeah, it was really wow. fun. Wow. Yeah. So she's she's watching as well. And uh and Jen says uh, you are definitely a, a lovety. Yeah, that's and, really nice. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Great conversation and everybody uh, thoroughly enjoying themselves. Sherry on Kansas. Uh, thank you, Priscilla. This has been a wonderful evening. Yeah, uh, you very little, little something simple. There's, there's well, some inspiration, right? She has them for a while, but after the conversation, um, really, really cool. And Terry Ann says she loves Bison Hamburgers, a restaurant in Cinnamon, New Mexico. Hmm. Um, that's cool. Bison hamburgers. Yeah. That first time I actually had bison when I was doing a show for years on iHeartRadio, I was sent over to the Westville kosher market in the Westville section of New Haven. Oh yeah, sure. And they said, we want you to try bison. Had you tried it before? And I hadn't at the time and we took it home and it was, you know, Westville kosher. Um, so we took it home and then we prepared it. But the uh, the owner of the kosher market said, now we're going to send you home with some of this and you're going to fall in love with it. Just do not, you know, with the kosher, don't put any cheese on it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, Jim, you're going to, I wanted to see the time. So I opened my iPad and all these people that are my friends are watching. And oh, fantastic. Isn't that wonderful? 
Was well, that all the dinging that I was hearing? Were they commenting? Exactly. Ding. Plus, I, I have a little work thing I have to do tonight. <laughs> I was worried it was that because I had no idea how late it got. But my wow. work thing is in California, so I have a little window left to it. Well, we encourage everybody watching to give this episode a uh, thumbs up like. There's a thumbs up icon on our YouTube channel next to this episode. Give us a thumbs up. That helps us uh, grow the show even further around the world. Leave a comment for us on our YouTube channel. And we would love it if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, which costs nothing. Just click the subscribe button, Jim Masters TV, and share the lovity, spread the word about our series uh, as everybody does, and you, I, as I say to all the guests, uh, uh, Chef Priscilla, um, we're going to keep the porch light on for you, and you are welcome back anytime. And I hope you enjoyed the time with me as much as I absolutely have with you. Really wonderful, terrific. Thank you so much, Jim. You have a great show. Terrific. I appreciate Signing that. Signing out, Lovety, Lovety Chester. Your lady. Lovety to you as well, my friend. And we'll uh, we'll see you soon, okay? All right. Looking forward to it, Jim. You take care. You be well. Have a good night. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Priscilla Martell, there is the website, gang. If you thoroughly enjoyed this episode, if this is your first time watching the Jim Masters Show Live series, there are well over 930 episodes with guests coming in again from Hollywood and television, film, music, stage, culinary arts, sports, and uh, everything you can think of, health and wellness. And we do this as an entertainment lifestyle celebrity talk show series. We just came upon our third year anniversary. Uh, for those watching for the first time, I work professionally in television and radio and stage and film. And this show was born out of the years on television and radio, which I still do. And it's a blast. We have so many great guests like our special guest on this episode, the incomparable chef Priscilla Martell, celebrated uh, chef, food consultant, food writer, recipe developer, restaurateur, and cookbook author extraordinaire. You can uh, find the books and everything else at PriscillaMartell.com. She makes her home in New England, USA, in Connecticut. And uh, she's a real delight, isn't she? She loves what she does. She's very, very expert at it, but uh, she's also very affable. And uh, we've known each other for years, again, through uh, Columbus House's wonderful chocolate to the rescue event uh, that happens where all these restaurateurs and all these pastry shops and chocolatiers gather to prepare all these incredible delectable chocolate creations that People come from all around to sample, and those dollars that come in from that uh, help those who are in need of shelter and housing. So it's a beautiful thing. And Priscilla is one of the judges. I'm the master of ceremonies uh, for a long time, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And here's one of the one of the shots with some of the other uh, chefs as well, and judges from previous years. And this was, uh, just this past March, uh, when Priscilla and I were together. And that's when I said, Priscilla, Hey, you know, we're doing this show, you know, cause she knew my work from television and radio. And I said, I'm doing the Jim master show live talk show series. Love to have you on. We just had had chef Jacques Pepin on only about a week before. And she was that day that you see this photo here that day, she was headed to his home on the Connecticut coast to have lunch. As uh, she mentioned, she and her husband and he and his wife and friends for a long time. And there is Priscilla and Charlie, uh, her husband, and uh, just some really great shots. This was the restaurant they had in Connecticut, which I had mentioned. And she's traveled the world and she uh, teaches and she shares. There's another shot as well. And, uh, we really got a chance to uh, dig in deep here. She loves what she does. And again, yeah, she was on season 11 of Martha Bakes with Martha Stewart on this episode here, which is really something special. And again, the books are all for the asking, and you can get those uh, at the website as well. First time here. Thanks for joining us, gang. Love having you here. Spread the word. We're here every day with this Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show series where we're bringing back the lost art of conversation. And uh, this is really, really cool. Thanks for all the great comments. Of course, you like to support what we do. You can do super chat, super emoji, uh, super, emoji, super stickers. That's in the 
uh, chat room, our lovely whole chat room where the show is live. Merlin says, I really enjoyed this show. Perfect. We love that. Jane in Sweden. Merlin watches in Ontario, Canada, religiously. Jane watches religiously in uh, Sweden. Uh, wonderful Priscilla. You even speak Swedish. Wow. Right. Hedja. And uh, Sherry Larson says, uh, thank you, Jim. Amazing show tonight as always. I think all of us, including your host here, we're going to grab something to eat. I think there is some clam chowder in here somewhere. We're going to heat it up, even though it's 20 after 10 p.m. Eastern time. I am famished. And I ate something before I started the show, but I'm famished from this conversation. Just my mouth has been salivating. Hmm. <laughs> And I'm sure yours is as well. Yeah, we are on the cusp. Uh, we Well, actually, we are on the high of our three-year anniversary. And um, Jim, uh, Jens in Pennsylvania says, congrats on your three-year anniversary. I thank you and appreciate you, and I love you. If you missed the anniversary episode, it was incredible. We had so many guests, Melissa Manchester, Lucy Arnez, so many fabulous folks. Uh, with their kind words celebrating. They were all guests on our show um, over the years, and it was really a delight to hear from all of them. And uh, we still have more of those videos coming in. So um, it was a wonderful show last night. If you missed it, it's archived on our YouTube channel. Also, the episode we did celebrating the 90th birthday of Carol Burnett, that was great too. And all the episodes, they're all archived. This will be archived on our YouTube channel as well. Jim Masters TV. Share the links, like, comment, subscribe. Well, we appreciate that. Time to eat, Jim, after the food show and then relax. Yes, we are going to grab something. Uh, Kathleen Walker in New York City, have a great night. Good night, all. Lovely hugs. Absolutely. Terry Ann says, uh, Jim and Priscilla, at, uh, you're nine year old, at nine years old, when you were nine, your grandmother taught you how to make homemade biscuits. Ah, uh, wow. That was your staple for bread. Biscuits. Mm. You know, she mentioned, Priscilla mentioned dumplings. That's another thing that I didn't mention, but I, I love dumplings. I'm a definitely a comfort food kind of guy. Thank you, Jane, and everybody watching. We're going to scoot out of here. We got to grab something to eat. We appreciate everybody being here. If you want to support what we do, there's super thanks on the YouTube channel, a little heart icon under this episode. You can click that. That helps support all these thousands of hours of content and episodes of our Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show series. And I uh, want to preview for you quickly uh, some of the folks that are coming up this week. We have an extraordinary week of guests that are coming up tomorrow. Ashley Crusado, award-winning actress, filmmaker, and producer and director is going to be with us here on the Gym Master Show Live series. Then on Wednesday, music legend, doo-wop legend from Norman Fox and the Rob Roy's, the iconic Norman Fox himself is going to be on the Gym Master Show Live, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Then coming up on Thursday, another icon, Broadway star, actress, director, and writer, Freddie Walker Brown's going to be on the Gym Masters Show Live series. Yes, and we are so excited about all these guests and so many more that are joining us here on uh, JMS for all of you, where we're bringing back that lost start of, uh, of conversation. We don't say goodbye. We say see you later. Ciao, cheers. Slancha, hejda, moy loop. Take care. Be well. Cheerio. Avida zain. Hasta la vista. Slancha. And uh, we love you all. Thanks for stopping by the Gym Master Show. We appreciate, again, our very special guest, Priscilla Martell, for stopping by and making us rather hungry. It was really cool to have her here and uh, share about her life and her passions and uh, a little of the behind the scenes and also some tips too, some techniques, some methods, some tips. She loved hearing what you guys were saying about some of the things you guys cook and prepare she was hoping you guys would do that and, she, you know, because she's interactive. So she really enjoyed that as I enjoyed having her here and having all of you here as well. So thanks for uh, stopping by the Jim Masters Show Live series. This is your host, Jim Masters, uh, thanking you for your time this time till next time. We'll be back here. Hope you join us again if this is your first taste 
of the Gym Master Show Life series. This is what we do. It's interactive. It's conversational. Every show is something different. And we invite you to return and come back and enjoy more right here at Lovety Hall on the Gym Master Show Live. For all of us here, thanks for being with us. Appreciate you as well watching all around the world. We'll see you on the next episode. Take care and be well. And cheers. <laughs>